you like to start? No, just you, you can start, please. Uh, sure. Uh, All right. Then, مساء الخير للجميع وأهلا وسهلا فيكم ببيتكم بالمنظمة العربية للأنون الدستورة وفي هذه الندوة بالشراكة مع زملائنا في International Idea وأتمنى أن الجميع يكون بخير وشكرا لانضمامكم اسمحوا لي بأن أرحب بضيوفنا اليوم الخبراء الدوليين بروفيسور كريستينا ماري بروفيسور أندرو لادلي ودكتور كاثرين شير قبل ما أعرف إذا عن خبرائنا وباختصار بالنسبة للندوة اليوم وبالنسبة للبرنامج المطروح نحن إذا بتذكروا في ختام المائدة المستديرة التي أقيمت في كامبالا التزمنا كمنظمة بإنتاج تقرير للمائدة منحاول من خلاله نعكس أهم النقاط اللي تم حواليها نوع من الإجماع أو التوافق بين المشاركين بطبيعة الحال بالنسبة للمواضيع التي تم طرحها في هذه المائدة والتزمنا بنفس الوقت بإنتاج أوراق خيارات تتعمق في هذه المسائل وأن نقوم هذه الندوة سيتم عرض أهم مخرجات وأهم مقترحات هذه الأوراق هن ورقتين ويتم النقاش بشأنه فنحن اليوم بفضل إذا الخبراء الدوليين الموجودين معنا سوف نتطرق لمسألتين أولها مسألة إذا الترتيبات بشأن تقاسم السلطة في المرحلة الانتقالية وصحيح أنه في التسلسل المنطقي للأمور هي المسألة التي سوف يتم يمكن تناولها بالأول ولكن بحكم التزامات الخبراء سوف تكون موضوع الجلسة الثانية أما الجلسة الأولى فسوف تتطرق فيها الخبيرتين لمسألة الترتيبات الدستورية في مرحلة ما بعد النزاع بما في ذلك مسألة إذا التسلسل في المرحلة الانتقالية ابتداء من عملية السلام وصولا لتبني الترتيبات الدستورية إضافة إلى مسألة عملية وضع الدستور بمراحلها وبالخيارات الجوهرية بشأنه وإذا استحضار أيضا هنا التجارب المقارنة اللي ممكن أن تكون مفيدة في هذا الشأن وعلى مستوى إذا المنهجية التي سوف نتبعها كما جرى الاتفاق أيضا في كامبالا الخبراء سوف يعرضون بشكل موجز أهم المخرجات وأهم الخيارات وهي خيارات مطروحة بطبيعة الحال للنقاش هن قاموا بالتحليل أخذا بطبيعة الحال وضع السودان والسياق الحالي والتحديات القائمة بعين الاعتبار وعلى أساسها حاولوا أنهم يقترحوا الخيارات ويستحضروا مثل ما قلت التجارب اللي ممكن أنه تكون مفيدة والهدف إذن أنه يعرضوا هذه المقترحات بشكل موجز وبنفس الوقت أنهم يطرحوا بعض الأسئلة عليكم واللي على أساسها يقوم النقاش إذن ونحاول برضو أن نتعمق بالمسائل اللي تم عرضها بمائدة المستديرة في كامبالا والتوصل أيضا لبعض نقاط التوافق في شأنه إذن أنا لن أطيل سوف أعطي الكلام إذن للخبيرتين بفسر كريستينا ودكتور كافن شعب اسمحوا لي ولو بصورة موجزة أن أعرف عن الخبيرتين إذا بروفيسور ماري مثل ما بتعرفوا كانت في الجهة اللي بتعنى بالوساطة في الأمم المتحدة وهي خبيرة في عمليات وضع دساتير عدة شاركت كخبيرة في لجنة وضع دستور في كينيا كذلك في فيجي لها خبرة وتجربة في اليمن مع الممثل الأمين العام وبدأت تجربتها في في جنوب افريقيا بطبيعه الحال اما بالنسبه لدكتور كاثرين شير فهي كمان خبيره دستوريه وهي مديره منظمه ماكس بلانك للاسم الدولي وهي تعنى ايضا بتقديم الدعم المؤسساتي للدول التي يعني لها ايضا تجارب في مراحل انتقاليه ولها خبره طويله خاصة وليس حصرا في صوماليا وفي جنوب السودان وفي السودان. إذا أترككم مع الخبيرتين 
ونتمنى انه النقاش يكون بناء وانه بطبيعه الحال يتم يعني عرض اولا الورقه بشكل موجز ومن بعدها الاسئله ومن بعدها النقاش تفضلوا I think it would be Professor Murray beginning. Okay, please. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for including me in this. Um, can, I ask, can I ask an interpretation question? How do I switch off hearing the Arabic interpretation? Yeah, uh, Bashir? Yes. Is that going to work now? You just you just go down in the in the in the screen and there is a there is a there is a there is a choice you can go to the interpretation and click there you'll find the language if you need english you click on english if you need arabic you click on arabic but so i've got that i've done that but you I... need to make sure you mute the original sound okay how do i do how do so i there's do the button right you got see, it got it you... thank you all right that's a trick all right Sorry about this delay. Um, so let's get going. Uh, the arrangement Catherine and I have for presenting this paper is I'm going to present the matters that are basically the sort of background, laying the groundwork. And Catherine will proceed to talk about, I suppose, really the more detailed stuff, the, the substance. Um, we've limited ourselves to talking about constitution making processes. And we've done that for two main reasons. The one is that it's just too much to talk about the content of the constitution and constitution making processes all in one go. But secondly, I think we were both aware that quite a lot of work has been done on the substance, particularly the substance of a future constitution in Sudan. So it was quite difficult to start talking about that. I think perhaps we'll hear from um, Sudanese yourselves on that matter. But we also want to emphasize at the outset that um, in talk, we, we talk quite generally about a process for constitution making, but it's extremely difficult to do this without knowing the nature of the settlement after the conflict, because any process that follows a conflict is heavily dependent on whatever the settlement actually is, and of course, also on who's involved in working out an initial settlement. Um, so we're very tentative, but we also both believe strongly, um, especially me actually from my um, South African experience, that the more these things have been thought about well in advance, the better, the easier it is to actually plan for something that a constitution making process and constitution that might work in the future. So although we're tentative, we don't think it's a, a bad exercise, if I put it like that. Um, so my first sort of, the first section in, in the paper, it, it is headed framing the constitution or framing the process of constitution making. And there one is interested in particularly what might be decided in a peace process about constitution making. And then also what other issues that are often handled in peace processes have a direct influence on constitution making and how one can make sure that they all manage together, that you don't have separate silos for dealing with things that in fact are closely interrelated. So we touch on three main issues, the question of government very briefly, the use of principles in setting up a constitution making process, and then some of the related issues. But before I talk about that, I want to briefly, briefly emphasize the issue of path dependency. Um, you will see we picked that up in the paper. Um, and there seems to be a lot of path dependency <coughs> in constitution making processes, in everything perhaps, but in constitution making processes. Um, you'll see to begin with a, a significant path dependency in peace agreements um, on how constitution making is dealt with. Um, may not be a bad thing, path dependency. But two paths, I think, two paths dominate. The first is constitution making, the design of a constitution making process often follows a country's own past experiences or successful processes in the neighborhood. So it's local 
examples. I actually have to add here that um, Kenya's process, Kenya's first process has become very influential. In fact, I think you can see signs of it in what was proposed um, in the South Sudan's transitional constitution and so on, and perhaps even in the 2019, your 2019 charter. Um, and I think one should sort of be warned a little bit about that first Kenyan process, the process that started in 2000 and ended as you probably all know, with a referendum that rejected the proposed constitution and which sowed the seeds for the conflict in Kenya in 2008. It's not a process that I know has worked anywhere in the world. So beware before you follow some, some neighbor's process, you know, learn both from their strengths and their weaknesses. So that's one element of path dependency. What you've done in the past and has worked, or what you've learned from what hasn't worked, what is done in the neighborhood or more broadly. The another path, path dependency issue is, particularly in peace agreements, I think, which are often done in a hurry, and by people who don't have a great deal of expertise in specific issues, there's a lot of cut and paste. And I think, again, if you thought through these issues well in advance, you may be able to avoid some of that rather hasty pasting together of processes um, and build a better process. So path dependency is not a bad thing and people are often more comfortable using processes that they're familiar with, comfortable with, but it's not ideally one that learns from past um, errors, mistakes. Um, and I'm assuming some elements of of constitution making would be in a constitution. Now the specific issues I refer to, I mentioned very, the, the paper mentions very briefly that we kind of anticipate, and I think that's why Andrew's paper is here, that there's very likely that a peace agreement will re result in some form of power sharing. As Andrew says clearly, power sharing is often um, uninclusive, the power that is shared is the power of the dominant conflict parties usually. So in thinking about constitution making, if constitution making, a constitution making process is to take place um, under a power sharing government, maybe it's worth thinking about arrangements for the interim period, for a transitional period that are more inclusive outside those in the executive itself or in the executive and legislative itself? Are there other ways of building more inclusion? And not saying very much, any more about that. Next point though, we touch on constitutional principles and I think peace agreements, as you all know, routinely call, include some principles. Often they're kind of very general things. Often it seems they included mostly to remind parties that they actually do agree on some things, even if they seem to agree on, disagree on most things. Um, and constitution making processes themselves are usually also bound by principles. Again, often they're very, very general. If the process is intended to produce a democratic constitution, it'll talk about independent courts, um, democracy, voting and so on. Um, those principles seldom seem to have any real impact on the actual business of constitution making. But constitution making principles can be binding. And my country, as most of you probably know, is an example of that. Um, what happened in South Africa is our principal negotiators agreed on a set of principles that would bind future constitution makers. That agreement on those principles was essential to actually reaching a peace agreement, call it that. Without that agreement on what was to go into a future constitution, we would have not got past apartheid really, or we would have probably been flung into, into um, a bad war. Um, so that use of constitutional principles is not only to set out sort of broadly accepted things about a democratic constitution, but also to reassure parties to the conflict then that um, their interests would, would be secured in the future. So it's a mechanism worth thinking about, not uncomplicated as we could discuss, but worth thinking about. Um, then thirdly, this issue of 
what we've called related matters in the constitution. I mean, one reason for being concerned about so-called related matters is I've been worried looking, I think, in fact, at the 2019 declaration, um, also in fact, at the South Sudan constitution making process, is discussion about how multi-level government, decentralization, whatever you want to call it, is dealt with, seems to be separated from how the constitution is being dealt with. There are not clear links between the ways those things are going to be handled. Um, now, there are places in which you can sort out decentralization well after the event. If you're familiar with the Tunisian constitution of 2014, you will see that it's got some very, in my view, lightweight provisions about decentralization. And they accepted that they'd take about 20 years to implement. You know, that's for Tunisia. Um, if some element of decentralization, perhaps even federalism, is part of a political settlement, and if decentralization is a means for keeping peace, for balancing power, for reassuring regional groupings, you're not going to be able to leave it to sort out in 20 years or over 20 years. It's likely that it's there are going to be elements of that deal in a peace agreement even, and we see a bit of it in the Juba peace agreement, um, and certainly into the constitution. So where does one sort out all the issues relating to decentralization? Um, and how does that dovetail connect with the constitution making process? Um, I think people tend not to think about how those things um, come together. And I think it could be really useful to figure out who's going to be involved in that decision making, decentralization decision making. I don't know whether some of the things you've already got in the Juba Peace Agreement, and of course your past practice is going to, how much that's going to weigh in, um, who are the parties that should be included. Going back to South Africa very briefly, South Africa is a very bad example there because we had such dominant and strongly supported main negotiating parties and not really much strength in our regions that we didn't really need, with one exception, to include um, regional groupings in sorting out our provincial system. Um, I think that was actually the case of Kenya too. Um, but that's not always the case. And I suspect, but you may correct me, that that's not the case in relation to Sudan. Um, we list a couple of other, what I've called connected issues in the paper, transitional justice, a land, um, the ones that, that typically arise and you will know more um, for your case. Um, but I see I've got about half a minute, minus half a minute left or something. So <laughs> let me just sort of put the last issue in my part of the paper or my part of this presentation on the agenda. And that's a question of inclusion. Um, now, I'm pleased to say that Andy's gonna pick up on inclusion a bit too, I believe, um, but I suppose our first point would simply be that just as you need the relevant elites included in a peace agreement for it to be effective, you need the relevant elites to be included in a constitution making process to, for it to be effective. I think there may be no example of a successful constitution making process by which I mean a constitution getting adopted in a sort of democratic way when that proposal has not been supported by the relevant or the main political elites. So people driven we saw in Kenya was a fantastic enriching experience, but it failed. You have to lock elites in too. So you don't let go of the people, but you get the elites in. So that's kind of the first point. Um, the second point I think is to think about um, the sort of different levels of inclusion. How do you get include people in decision-making bodies? Do you want a public participation program as one would normally have nowadays? And then a third type of inclusion would re relate to referendums. And my last point is going to be on that, although we don't deal with it in the paper. Um, referendums generally, I don't think are particularly inclusive. That's one point, but also can be very dangerous. So one needs to think hard about using referendums as a tool of inclusion. 
Thanks very much. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, Tamara, you want me to present immediately after? Yep. Yeah? Perfect. All right. Um, well, I have um, in view of, I thought, the challenges that come probably with translation prepared a handful of slides on PowerPoint, which might facilitate the translation a little bit. So if you allow, I, I would share my screen now to so that you can also um, see the presentation. Just one second. Um, I think you're a co-host, so you should be able to. Yeah, I'm just seeing if it's working. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Yeah? Wonderful. All right, well, um, first of all, um, please um, allow me to extend my sincere gratitude to the Arab Association of Constitutional Law and especially Dr. Tamara, as well as International Idea, Mr. Sami, um, for having invited me to contribute to this most distinguished forum of Sudanese experts. And um, it is very clear to me that the real experts on the Sudanese process are among the audience here, the Sudanese participants of this webinar. Um, and I'm really humbled to be given a voice in this forum to, to add some observations from an outside comparative perspective and hopefully promote further work and critical debate about uh, constitution making in Sudan post-conflict. Now, um, after um, Christina has um, shared um, a few questions and raised a few questions on um, principles um, for constitution making, questions of inclusions, um, questions on, um, you know, the peace agreement as such and the political decisions that need to be taken. Um, in the second part of the paper, um, we address a bit the options for the process of making a constitution in Sudan post-conflict. And um, questions that come with it um, are obviously questions of um, sequencing, questions of which constitution making bodies should be used, but also um, what elements um, of a constitution making process can actually build the legitimacy of a constitution. And so um, these are some of the issues that um, I would like to address and briefly outline in, in this presentation. Again, I do realize we are very pressed for time, so um, I will keep my remarks short and I'm very much hoping that um, we'll actually um, have the chance to discuss in more detail um, afterwards and refer to any questions that you may may have. Um, let me just um, maybe start uh, very briefly after Christina has raised her points that in terms of the methodology that we applied, um, an important element, in fact, was the question of path dependency. Um, path dependency in a sense that um, we looked at the comparative examples, particularly in the region, but also um, looked at Sudanese history of constitution making as we did realize that specifically when it came to the process of constitution making in Sudan, there is a considerable degree of repeated patterns that can be observed, and that might be an indication for a future process um, taking place in South Sudan. Once again, also talking about the constitution making process, um, we had certain assumptions, we um, and this is also addressed in Andrew's paper, um, we assumed the negotiated peace in Sudan um, will uh, take place and on the basis of which and after which a constitution for the longer term will be drafted um, and a political settlement will certainly, um, you know, regulate an understanding of how power should indeed be constrained and exercised. And um, the first 
question that um, is to be raised in this context is when it comes to the constitution making process. And as Christina outlined, we chose to focus on the process and not so much on the on the substance of constitution making. But looking at the process, um, it is generally helpful to think of post conflict constitution making in uh, stages. And um, uh, these stages can be even a one stage process, which would mean that a permanent constitution is, for example, drafted in the framework of a peace process, while, for example, a country is governed by international forces, as it was the case um, in Namibia, in East Timor, where you had um, UN supervised process of um, constitution making that went hand in hand um, and eventually led uh, to Namibia's independence. Um, and in countries that have suffered from prolonged internal conflict and uh, have a lack of a sound and functioning institutional framework, um, the constitutional process as part of the transition is frequently structured into two stages. And two stage processes stretch the transition with an interim transition providing for a provisional constitutional framework that precedes a more permanent constitutional framework. And when you have such a two-stage process, which was in fact in the history of Sudan, um, so far, um, save two exceptions, always the case. So in the seven um, constitutional um, experiences, drafting experiences that Sudan has undergone, five of them were in fact um, interim constitutional arrangements that foresaw a permanent constitutional framework to be drafted afterwards, which due to circumstances, due to upheaval political changes in the end not, did not happen, but in itself foresaw two stage processes, which is very interesting in the sense that Sudan has always made that choice um, of a two stage process. Obviously that brings up the question, is this what Sudan will be looking at when we look at the future constitution making process? Process, or is it time or momentum to change the staging arrangement of, um, of the constitution making process? Um, the classic example of a two stage process is certainly um, South Africa. And um, there, um, what we had was, in fact, an interim constitution that was drafted by unelected negotiators, then adopted by the white South African parliament. And um, that interim constitution set up a process for making the final constitution after elections, which was the second stage. And the critical element of this two-stage process here is that in between, you did have elections. And this way, it allowed the fi final constitution to be drafted and adopted by a democratically elected body, the uh, democratically elected constitutional assembly in South Africa. So um, um, two-stage processes um, with an interim constitution as a first step before or engaging in a permanent constitution making process were also, for example, used in cases of Egypt, the Central African Republic, Ethiopia, Euro Rwanda, um, Burundi, for example. And as I mentioned before, it has been a very prominent feature of constitution making processes in Sudan's history post independence. Um, since 1956, in the constitutions of 1964, um, 1985, um, 2005 um, and also in 2019 in the constitutional charter, in fact, a um, two-stage constitution making process was foreseen or is foreseen, whereas only the two adopted constitutions of 1973 and 1998 um, under President Nimeri and um, Omar al-Bashir respectively constituted permanent constitutions as they were drafted. Um, this first question is the question of the staging of the process. The next question that obviously um, is tied to the staging of the constitution making process is the big question of elections. When to hold elections in a two stage process? Do you hold elections in between um, having passed an interim constitutional framework, um, like in the case of South Africa, hold elections and then ensure that a democratically elected body is the one um, guiding the, the permanent constitution making process? 
or as was the case, for, for example, foreseen after the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement um, in Sudan, which um, also foresaw an interim constitutional arrangement. But then within this interim constitutional arrangement, the INC of 2005 foresaw the drafting of a permanent constitutional framework without scheduled elections being a condition upon which the permanent constitutional process should have been initiated. So there's a, a large difference between um, these two processes and the timing of elections. When do you hold elections? And um, these questions of when you hold elections is certainly um, dependent on a number of factors that um, that are considerations that should be taken into account. First of all, um, how will the constitution be adopted and uh, legitimized? Um, secondly, will the demands of the people of Sudan for a people-driven, legitimate and inclusive constitutional process um, be better met before or after elections? And thirdly, um, will parties to a peace agreement um, in Sudan trust that a future constitution-making process will protect their interests? So these are also the three questions that we highlighted in the paper and that I hope we'll get a chance to debate further um, in the Q&A session. A final point that we address in the paper, also very superficially, but um, which is interesting to look at, particularly from a Sudanese perspective and a historical perspective in Sudan, is the composition of the drafting bodies of the in the constitution making um, process. So far um, in Sudan, post independent, um, in the constitution making process, um, the drafting of the constitutional text has predominantly be done, been done by executive appointed expert commissions. Um, this was the case, for example, of the 2005 INC, Interim National Constitution, but also in previous um, constitution making processes in Sudan, it was mainly an appointed expert body that um, was drafting the constitutional text. In the Constitutional Charter of 2019, as amended by the Chuba Peace Agreement, interestingly enough, um, what the Constitutional Charter foresees is a constitutional conference. And um, it just gives um, certain indications of what the constitution-making process could look like. It doesn't outline any details. Um, also, the Chuba Peace Agreement um, keeps it in very general terms without um, offering many details. But it's interesting to see um, that this idea of a constitutional conference is is raised in the constitutional um, charter of 2019. The big question will certainly be in the forthcoming constitution making process, whether um, the arrangements foreseen in the constitutional charter, which to this day remains the supreme law of the land, will actually hold. Um, if this process that is foreseen, if this process that has been outlined and specified to a certain extent in the Chuba Peace Agreement by which the constitutional charter was amended, um, if um, this arrangement will also um, persist in a um, post-conflict situation in Sudan as it has yet to come. Um, this, just very briefly, a few of the points that um, we addressed um, in the paper and um, hopefully um, we'll be able to discuss some of these um, in more detail now that we um, get questions from the participants. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Murray, Dr. Sher. Um, can we open the floor for any questions or any issues that I don't want to talk about in a general way? I think I'll ask you a few questions and I think it's possible that it can be started. So if anyone wants to use the hand or maybe if الكاميرا دايرة برضو يسأل سؤال من أمي تبحدان تفضل يا سلمى 
shukran. I think thank you to Catherine and thank you to Christina for the very extensive paper. It was extremely informative, I think, and it really does add to the question of, you know, the real challenges that I think Sudan is facing in terms of its constitution making process. And I think the real challenge that took place during the transition in terms of the implementation of the peace agreement itself, the GPA implementation in Sudan was a very challenging time. Um, I think for the transitional government, um, because as you mentioned, Catherine, just in your comment that the, the, the GPA itself did not really give guidelines on how the processes should be, not only in regards to um, constitution making, but I think in terms of, uh, you know, addressing other issues, whether it do with security reform or whether it do with, you know, transitional justice processes, I think that the GPA was very kind of open-ended in terms of how those processes should take place. Um, I think what, what, what I wanted to kind of get your two pences on here is, you know, going forward, I think we've seen the challenges in the GPA, but I think I'm really interested to hear uh, from both of you in terms of, um, you know, inclusivity. I think the process in the peace agreement previously, the GPA was very much, you know, directed towards addressing um, basically the needs of opposition groups and really addressing the needs of, uh, you know, power sharing I'm um, really addressing the needs or the wants of political parties, and it very much, and it did very little, sorry, to address the needs of the Sudanese people. So I think uh, it will be really interesting to kind of see or to hear from you in terms of, you know, ensuring inclusivity going forward in terms of how to address that issue and, and you know, to get Sudanese people to be at the center of one, the peace agreement, any upcoming peace agreement. And I think this is the challenge that we're still seeing until today. Um, and, and, and how to really ensure going forward, you know, these processes, constitutional making processes, processes are very inclusive of the Sudanese, the lay Sudanese person. Um, and, and I would like to see that more addressed maybe in the paper of, of, of how to go about, you know, including the Sudanese person in that process and how to ensure, you know, gender representation, youth representation, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, you know, as you may know, Sudan is is very diverse. You know, we have a lot of very various um, uh, cultures and traditions. And how do you address that challenge? Uh, how, how do you make it an inclusive process, regardless of our differences as Sudanese people? Um, and again, thank you, Christine and Catherine, for this very informative paper. Thank you so much. Over. I don't know um, who wishes to respond. I don't know, Christina, do you want to start? I just wanted to maybe just briefly outline in the beginning, indeed, um, that's a very good point you raise in terms of um, participation of um, the Sudanese, um, um, in fact, looking again at um, Sudanese constitution making processes in the history of Sudan since 1956, so far there has been a complete absence of a people driven constitution making process in all the processes that you had in Sudan. So far, this has never been a consideration or an, a real uh, aim of a constitution making process to include the people um, of, South, uh, of Sudan. And interestingly enough, it's the first time in the Chuba peace agreement that you have actually a clear um, outspoken um, you know idea or aim to make the constitution making process an inclusive one and one that is people driven and includes um, the citizens of, of Sudan and this is um, very interesting um, it's very interesting to see it on paper but there's no further mention of how this shall in fact be um, implemented or how this shall become reality and um, maybe Christina um, you mainly worked on the inclusion aspect of our paper if you want to speak also the element of vertical um, inclusion that was certainly one um, of the the um, aspects that we brought up in the in the paper right so I find this an incredibly difficult question and I think it's the right question but it's a really difficult question that I struggle with and so you know I agree with what you said in asking the question and Catherine's points and I really sort of found myself struggling to know where to start 
Um, so we do the easy bit in the paper. We talk about um, inclusion in decision-making. We make the categories that you're probably familiar with. Inclusion in decision-making bodies, you know, let's get diverse groups and mention that the other element of inclusion, of course, is the production of inclusive institutions. So you want your outcomes to be inclusive as well. So that's quite easy to say. And then you can also, I think, roughly look at, say, inclusion with people involved in decision making, what Catherine's just, Catherine's just referred to as vertical inclusion, sort of ensuring um, that people broadly can influence the process in some way or um, be involved in the constitution making process. So that would be horizontal, the people in the decision making bodies and vertical. Okay, and then how do you make all of this work? And I don't think anyone has actually succeeded. I was thinking this morning as I was pondering this, what one might say in this meeting, actually back to the Yemen national dialogue. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the way the the national dialogue was put together. I think it was about four, 580 people or so, if I remember it correctly. And it was made up of a, a number of blocks of sectors, I suppose. So the parties had various blocks, I think it was two or three, quite a lot of them were drawn from the parties. They were drawn, um, I don't know how they worked out the proportions and the strength, that was part of the political deal. Um, but each um, party delegation was required to be a bit diverse in the sense of having women in it, um, having um, young people in it and so on. So, and then there was a block for women and there was a block for young people and there was a block just generally for civil society. And I can't remember quite what else, you may recall others. And perhaps the South, because that was one of the big contentious issues, had a, a block as well. Each of the blocks required the, the sort of diversity that I've just mentioned. Um, young people, women, um, and in fact, I think representatives of the South and so on. The big problem there, of course, was how do you choose these people? How do you decide who gets into this sort of open civil society group? Who are the women who go in? And I know that to begin with, they were quite ambitious. To begin with, they had a sort of open call for those slots. Um, and people, I met one delegate to the National Dialogue, who said she'd applied online. Um, and I said to her, do you know how you were chosen? She said she had no idea. A whole lot of her friends had also applied, but she'd been picked out. Then I kind of discovered that the way they'd, that they'd got stuck, because of course, when all the names came in, the political parties were interested. And we know that everybody in these processes, almost everybody, almost everybody, is affiliated in one way or another. I mean, civil, members of civil society are not themselves apolitical and neutral generally. So I under, what I understood actually happened is the parties couldn't agree, the, the main sort of conflict parties or whatever, you know, the old, the government and the South and so on, um, and Sarala as well at the time, I suspect. Um, and they finally deferred to the special envoy, um, Jamal Benema, and he sort of formally was given the role of trying to figure out the composition. And he must have paid attention to what people were saying about the affiliation of all those people. But I, I tell that rather long story just to say it's always difficult to, to sort of move from the commitment to inclusion in a decision-making bodies or in committees that might feed into decision-making bodies or even on the staff of a constitution-making body. So to move from the principle and the commitment to be more inclusive to actually selecting people is hard. And the best way around it, of course, is to have very organized civil society, civil society that's become used to talking to elements in it. And even if it's quite itself quite diverse and not agreed on everything, if you've managed to build civil society that can come to agreements. That's a big lobby for proposing people to help groups become, decision-making bodies become more diverse. But, you know, it doesn't, I haven't come across a magic answer. There's much more to say about vertical inclusion, different mechanisms for listening to people, hearing people, listening to people, um, not just having public submissions stored in some big room and then thrown away, 
but actually used, and having constitution makers respond to people who make submissions to constitution making bodies, which I personally think is one of the most important parts of this kind of process. But we could have a very long conversation about different, and I'm sure many of you have experienced some of them, different forms of more and less effective ways of drawing the public in and giving them a real opportunity to contribute to the process, um, even if it is rather crowdsourcing. I don't know if that helps. Any other questions from the participants? I think Andrew, please. Um, I wave my hand um, because if nobody else says anything, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. And uh, when I uh, do my paper, I'll greet everyone uh, more. But um, just to say on this question, what's interesting about uh, looking at the both at Yemen and, and at Sudan is that the street drove uh, the conditions and in many other places in the Arab Spring, the street drove the conditions that produced the need for change. And then the question was how to include them, uh, and indeed, from the military points of view, how to exclude them, how to get past the uh, the tensions and the, the hold that they had on freezing public life, and how to move past them. And what's the commentary that I've seen about Sudan says that the that the capacity to protest in the street was then not matched by the capacity to participate and uh, and the invitation to participate in the processes that followed, which meant that that huge energy was lost and indeed was moved aside. So what's interesting for me in thinking forward about inclusion is how to develop that capacity and how to ensure that the energy that was there in the street is in some ways able to be channeled and represented and part and continue to participate because it otherwise uh, disappears and with it goes the um, uh, goes all the energy that was there in the constitution making process in terms of um uh, the Juba peace agreement's invitation or suggestion that uh, there would be wider participation. Uh, it's not coincidence, uh, in my view, that there was no implementation mechanism for that. In fact, everything about those processes suggests that uh, that they would that they never intended to give any kind of uh, implementation of those of those hopes. Uh, neither to the constitutional principles that are in the transitional constitutional arrangements. And in terms of Sudan's past history, that's a very clear path dependency in the sense of when you read about all the principles that are in the various agreements, they have always been put aside in all the agreements going back to 2005. So the principles are there, and indeed the idea of participation might be raised, but the implementation mechanisms have always been missing. So that's just a brief con uh, contribution on this point. Thank you very much, Andrew. I will allow myself um, not to um, ask a personal question, but rather to convey as faithfully as possible some of the questions that came up with regards to inclusion in the round table. And I think both uh, Sherbil, Sami are, are my witnesses that this came up time and again. And perhaps to you, um, Christina, on the question of inclusion, at least in the round table, what kept coming up was um, how to balance, how to reconcile the need for inclusion with um, the fact that at least some of the parties involved in the conflict um, have committed crimes against humanity. In other terms, what, what do you do in that transitional period to guarantee inclusion, but perhaps not at the expense of some kind of transitional justice. Again, conveying what came up time and again during the round table. And to complete that with a question 
on um, one of your last uh, comments regarding referendums and how they can potentially be dangerous. So perhaps to put the question differently, and again, because some participants did express interest in there being a referendum at some point, what in positive terms would be some conditions that a referendum should meet for it precisely to, to be an inclusive mechanism rather than a double-edged sword or this polarizing mechanism? I may not be the best person to to have a, to think about to talk about um, this transitional justice thing. My, um, my my first instinct, I suppose, is to wonder whether if one has uh, agreed transitional justice that people have confidence in. Okay, and I know there's a sequencing issue here, but if one has that agreed, whether it would be easier for people to have suspects, perpetrate, potential alleged perpetrators at the negotiating table. So that's, and I'm saying that because I kind of worry that if you exclude that, you know, there's certain people who you probably can't exclude because they wield enough power to be necessary for an agreement. Um, you know, and I said to begin with, and it's something that I've sort of learned more and more, come to believe more and more strongly, is you just have to have the people who wield power in agreements and in constitution making actually also. So, so I'm sort of playing with that, but I think perhaps, particularly Andy, perhaps, I'm not sure, and others at the table may have had more experience in this and we could perhaps come back to referendums, which is a bit of a separate issue. I think the tea, I'm going to say one more thing, one thing that does worry me a bit about what I saw in draft constitutions for Sudan that were floating around around about, um, I suppose it was 2020, early 2020 or 2022, um, was that there were very grand statements about transitional justice in them, very, very ambitious statements about transitional justice. And again, my feeling was that, uh, I mean, you know, this is not... I find it terribly hard to sort of suggest one needs to be restrained about how much tr transitional justice you get. Um, but again, it's, it is a transition. So the justice arrangements really need to fit the transitional nature of the situation and sometimes just demanding a sort of, perhaps putting too much in that peace agreement. Um, demands too much, but also may close some doors. So it's a sort of su suggestion that caution is needed or constraint, perhaps. Um, yes, I will talk about this a bit more later, but just following on Christina's points, incidentally, there's about five people in my life uh, who know me from a period where I was called Andy, and Christina's one of them. And um, so uh, uh, nice to see you again. Um, I think the difficulty that I want to point out is that uh, all these arrangements require consent. And if you don't get the consent of the key parties, including those that have been the fighting parties, then your agreement right from the beginning is vulnerable. Um, at the same point, time, as we'll see uh, in my presentation, your real risk is that if you put the people who've done the most damage in positions of power in the transition, they are likely to continue to do that damage. And so the dilemma that Christine is pointing at is one of the central ones in transitions, is that there has to be some mechanism for moving away from the violence of the past but that requires the people with the guns to agree to put them down. And, um, and how you do that without them saying, if you create an existential threat for me, I won't put my gun down because I'll have to fight to stay alive. How you do that um, without allowing them also to, um, to, to be in a position to destroy the transition is gonna be one of Sudan's central questions. Um, it, uh, I'll get onto this in, 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 in more detail. It's one of the key questions of power sharing. 
but it is also one of the key questions of transitional justice because if you don't learn from the past you're going to repeat it and um that's uh, that's been evident everywhere but the timing is a critical question i mean argentina's transitional justice came decades after the transition and um and it is going to be an a, an important question it, is if you don't consolidate the transition then your parties with the power to wreck it uh, may go after it and that's exactly what happened in yemen the the key parties with the power to to destroy the transition um uh in fact were never fully in it and um and uh, but that's a discussion uh, that christina was part of so um, you may want to say something more about about Yemen's uh, difficulties of getting key players with the capacity to wreck it in, to stay in the process. Um, Christina, do you want to go ahead or shall we, uh, one, one participant, Dr. Adib is asking uh, to speak. So perhaps we can take his question intervention and then back to you, Christina. Yeah, while well, I think about this difficult question, Andrew has, Andrew has said. <laughs> Great. Dr. Adib, Fadal. Yeah, let me start by uh, expressing my profound gratitude for the organizers for uh, organizing such important uh, event and indeed for the presentation for the presenters with this uh, important inf information and the great uh, presentations uh looking at this uh, in a comparative uh, from the comparative standpoint uh the situation in sudan in comparison to the case uh, to the cases that was uh, talked about uh, i'm wondering in this in in this kind of situation whereby we are in the middle of uh, violence, in the middle of war, in the middle of uh, suffering of uh, conflict-affected uh, population. And uh, the, some of them are in Sudan as IDPs, others of them are in the neighboring countries, uh, others of them in the diaspora. Uh, so my question, how can... Uh, uh, constitution making process or a constitution, the conversation about the constitution at the beginning can be held and uh, in, 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 in the process of it. So if there's any ideas of how can this fragmentations of everything in the middle of violence can make a constitution or ideas of, uh, of a constitution. Thank you. Christina, if you want to. I might leave that to somebody else, but if I can go back to, there's still a referendum thing lurk, lurking around also, but as I said after Andrew spoke, I mean, I find this Yemen question really difficult, but yes, everyone was not kept in the deal. It was probably never very inclusive to begin with, but at least sort of there was a sort of major change of regime. And, you know, as I've just briefly thought about it, so many little things seem to chip away at keeping people on board. I mean, one thing that always comes to my mind is with the stroke of a pen, the fuel subsidy was removed. It turns out that the fuel subsidy was primarily used by the military or one particular division in the military. And again, people who studied Yemen more may know better than I do on this. But I think one or two particular divisions benefit of the military, benefited especially from the fuel levy, because they brought the bought the fuel in Yemen, at the fuel subsidy, I mean, bought the fuel in Yemen, subsidized, and then sold it out of the country at market rates. And with that money that they got, that sort of bonus, they paid off their huge patronage arrangements. And so they kept power that way. When that money suddenly taken away, there's a huge disruption in the process. And that was one of the triggers of things starting to fall apart. So these very small things happening. Another thing that I often wonder about is whether, going back to Andrew's very point, the, the, the change was really started by the street, 
Um, but the South and a particular part of, or particular political part of the South of Yemen kind of took over and came to dominate the process. So, you know, every decision had to have a 50% support of the South and so on. So there again, the sort of, the, the issues got almost hijacked. Um, but, and of course it all got focused in Sana. So then the questions must be about whether, how one actually, uh, well, this is what I was going to say, sorry, I'm just collecting my thoughts while, I, while I'm here. But one thing I often also wonder about is when, the committee that was set up to design the national dialogue started work before starting fulfill its, to fulfill its mandate, which was about how many people should come to the dialogue and what the different commissions should be about. They came up with a set of what they called the 20 points. And the 20 points were conditions that they said should be met or things that should be done before the national dialogue was to start. And those points included things like apologizing for various atrocities actually in the past, in the quite distant past, in fact, 20 years before, um, remedying some of the gross marginalization in the Sada area, the area in which Sarala is really born and the Houthis dominate. Um, remedying some of the, the problems, dispossession of property and so on in the South. It was a very ambitious list. It was totally ignored and the process went ahead nonetheless. And I've sort of also often wondered if some of those things had been done and there'd been some steps taken down the path of a changed Yemen, rather than just launching into a big hotel and talking about abstract ideas, um, would that have helped keep more people on board? It would have involved in much more engagement with the military rather than security issues being dealt with on the side, really, and obviously unsuccessfully, um, and so on. So those are some random thoughts. I haven't thought about this for a while. <laughs> Maybe they can provoke some discussion elsewhere in this group. Maybe just um, to add to a few thoughts that Christina just had, and I, I hope I did understand Dr. Adib's question correctly, that he he was wondering how is it possible to talk about constitution making processes while the war is ongoing and, you know, um, the country is in the middle of a protracted conflict. Did I understand that uh, correctly? Dr. Adib, was that that was your question? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, that is uh, the question. I need like some wisdom and uh, ideas about how we can do that. Uh, before the conflict, uh, we were working on this constitution making processes as a grassroots level. So, uh, what I'm uh, requesting some ideas, wisdom on how to resume in the middle of violence. Well, I mean, certainly with um, war still still raging in Sudan today, it's immensely difficult to predict um, what a future constitutional process in post-conflict Sudan could potentially look like. Um, you know, the features of the precise process will depend on the context, the composition, and the outcome of the negotiations that lead to a peace agreement, uh, a transitional arrangement. And um, uh, it was, for example, very interesting in the case of South Sudan that actually in 2018 signed a peace agreement and um, where questions um, of a constitution-making process were deliberated. It was interesting to see that even while violence was still ongoing and the country still had not reached a final um, agreed um, 
peace settlement, um, that different versions of what um, a future constitution could or should look like in South Sudan or were already circulated by different um, political parties, civil society representatives, et cetera, et cetera. So it was interesting to see that despite the fact that there was no full-blown peace agreement to support such a process yet in place, still um, various fractions of society had started the dialogue and the debate of um, not so much what the process would look like, but what, um, in fact, um, the substance of such a constitution must consider. And this was mainly questions of um, a federal arrangement, questions of transitional justice, etc. So um, that debate, I dare say, um, since the first attempt of a constitution making process in 2012 in South Sudan, never really stopped. Um, however, it's undeniable that um, for the first time, questions of a process design for such a permanent constitution making process really were only possible once a peace agreement was in place and um, once um, a power sharing arrangement was agreed on. And only then um, could this conversation start about, you know, how to design the constitution making process. So. I am um, in the case of Sudan, um, I don't think I would have the answer for you to say, you know, how shall this process um, already take place while war is still raging in the country. But I do think a forum like this only shows how many ideas and thoughts uh, there already are from the side of um, representatives um, in Sudan and how active this debate and deliberation is already um, at present while the war is still happening. Just a quick um, contribution um, to uh, build on, on Catherine's and Dr. Adib's um, points. Uh, by the way, um, Catherine, thank you so much for your map behind you. It's one of the few maps that's got New Zealand uh, in it. And I like very much that I can see little New Zealand tucked away in the bottom corner of the map behind you. And um, most uh, there's a sort of movement in New Zealand to say, please don't leave us off the map because many world maps cut off that last little bit. Um, I'm happy. I'll make space for New Zealand, especially. Uh, with... That's right. I'm, I'm enjoying being able to see it. There I am. Um, on this difficult question of, uh, and it's a really, really important question, in the middle of conflict, what you can see from South Sudan and indeed from Sudan is that the principal military parties look at how they can use the transition in the future to consolidate their position, not to hand over power to an elected group. What they're looking for is processes by which their access to resources, and Christina gave a, an example of one. Um, you know, in Sudan, there's going to be a really difficult question with what to do with the rapid support forces access to gold from Darfur. In uh, South Sudan, the major military parties were also parties that had leveraged their access to power and to constitution making to gather resources and to consolidate a, 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 an ethnic control uh, by their a military group of resources that they could then distribute, distribute in a sort of patrimonial kind of way to their followers. So the real quest difficulty of working in the midst of a conflict is that the mindsets of the parties are not about a future constitutional system where everybody has access to power, to resources, where there's a taxation system, but they're looking for how to consolidate not only their own uh, survival in terms of the existential risks that come from, from stopping fighting or putting down their arms as they see it, but how they can, can uh, uh, use the process to, to gain access to the resources that previously they've got from their, from their uh, at the power of the gun. And so 
the, the, the really hard issues of trying to discuss a transitional process that envisages a completely different access to resources, a completely different access to power, elections, is that those things by definition threaten the military. It's one of the reasons why the military, I believe, overthrew the transition is that they were not prepared to, to hand over power to the civilians. As the time got closer for the, the, the military to hand over power, so the so Sudan transition got more and more vulnerable because the military weren't prepared to hand over. So in my uh, humble view, Dr. Adib, a question goes to the absolute heart of the difficulties. The, it is going to be very hard to get these parties to discuss real constitutional change when they feel so vulnerable in the process. The, um, they know that a transition will lose the power and the access and the special resources that they've had. Uh, the Sudan military, just like Egypt's military, and the rapid support uh, 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 forces have got access to massive amounts of gold, primarily laundered through the United Arab Emirates, which enables them to buy and to keep supplying them weapons. How is a transitional process going to affect that is what they're interested in. So from my point of view, the commentary on this question is that is not just, of course, to acknowledge that it's it's really hard, but there are examples uh, from lots of places where these issues have become uh, where central questions. People may remember in the past the problem of conflict diamonds, which particular armed groups had access to. And the key question was, how are you going to move from the access to their resources to a constitutional government? Now, those are hard questions for Sudan. They were hard questions everywhere. And I think in some ways, Dr. Adib's questions points at that. And uh, perhaps, Dr. Adib, you'd like to follow up. Dr. Adib, you're muted if you're using the mic. Uh, no, in fact, I don't have that uh, from the previous uh, uh, time. <laughs> I don't have a uh, follow up uh, on that. But, uh, thank you so much. I think it's very, it's very, it's very clear uh, and it deepened uh, my thinking about how difficult it is having 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 in mind that the situation in Sudan it might be a little bit differ, differ than the situation in South Sudan with the recent interest and the proxy war and, and so but thank you so much that is very uh, very useful uh, to hear from you uh Christina if you wish to and then uh, I think Selma wants to um well I think we should stick to this conversation because it's really interesting and I to follow Andrew's point I was you know I saw a, a, a document talking about how the the Khartoum effort after 2019 just to record all the companies and corporations I mean again you must know about this companies and corporations that kind of were being used by the military and intelligence services and even that process you know, went somewhere, which impressed me that it actually managed to move at all. But of course, um, became harder and harder to complete, especially as far as the intelligence service was concerned. But don't let me... Salma? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think mine was just an addition, maybe that I think maybe something we should think about and keep in mind is that, you know, the current war has kind of added wood to the fire of, you know, the Sudanese people's loss in hope for kind of a transition or a way forward. So I think, you know, how to also build up the momentum among Sudanese people to, you know, look into kind of the way forward and how to be accepting of a transition again. If we, we you know, as Sudanese people, I think they feel now that they've really been let down by the people who are involved in the transition, specifically the civilian side, 
and I think even more the civil society side of things. So I think also maybe just to add to Adib's question is how to, to keep that momentum amongst the Sunnis people in, in terms of, of supporting a future transition or constitution making process or a peace agreement process going forward. Uh, over, thank you. Um, who would like to see my hand is up? Should I come in? <laughs> I say, comparing things as everyone has really suggested is so difficult. But of course, one thing that amazes me always is the way the African National Congress in South Africa, you know, managed to keep up momentum, you know, under not quite as terrible circumstances as we as you're experiencing Sudan in Sudan at the moment. But nonetheless, for a very, very long period, many people just sustained resistance. Now, one of the great advantages I've come to think for them was they slowly, not easily, but did build up massive international support. Um, and I, I really think a large part of um, South Africa's, the reason for South Africa managing the transition was international pressure. Um, now, I don't, you know, you need how you do that. I, in different circumstances, I don't know that the proxy war issue is particularly horrible um, and makes it very, very hard. Um, but that is just one thought that, that comes to mind. Maybe, and just to add to what Christina just said, um, what appears to also create or keep a certain amount of momentum is actually to see civil society trying to keep organized to um, not um, what you see, for example, in South Sudan is an immense difficulty of um, that there is no organized civil society. And the fact that um, civil society in itself is so um, so conflicted and, 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 and fighting against each other that, in fact, um, uh, the momentum is lost by them simply embarking in, um, you know, in disputes over um, how to frame the process, where to go and um, to keep um, communication and momentum up. And so I do think that um, momentum might also be lost with a fragmented civil society and um, a, a level of, um, um, yeah, an organized element that could keep up and preserve um, the momentum as much as international support could, um, in the case of South Africa, create more momentum. And if I could just add to that, the, the analysis that I've read of this process is that uh, the extraordinary amount of organization in the street and in the various committees was were primarily directed to to sustain the momentum of protest and demand for change uh, the ANC had uh, decades of being a disciplined movement primarily directed towards change and it had spent decades preparing and planning its political platforms and its mechanisms and its decision-making and who was going to be allowed to speak in which place. These issues paralyzed Sudan. And um, when a few groups were brought in, but others weren't, and all the momentum went out of the protest because it was no longer necessary because there was some mechanism for change. So one of the commentaries that I've led, that I've read is about preparing for this process in a much more careful way to sustain the decision-making and the participation and the connections between uh, the various groups and the, um, and the transitional process. Um, in contrast, or put the other way, the whole purpose of the military was in fact to dissipate, to reduce this momentum. They wanted people off the streets one of the consistent demand from the street was for accountability for the massacres that happened by the Sudan armed forces. And the Sudan armed forces wanted this all to go away. And, um, and they succeeded. It, it, it worked. And uh, the, the, the heart of the protest went out. 
and all of a sudden people were into tr other transitional arrangements and the difficulties then of making decisions uh, became very clear. That, pro that uh, peace agreement that you referred to, Catherine, involving uh, the Juba peace agreement was primarily shaped by the Sudan armed forces, not by the transitional government. And this took a substantial amount of, of, uh, of uh, kind of power, really, out of the transitional process. And it appears to have delivered the clear picture that actually the real uh, government with the capacity to lead Sudan forward was the military. The military then, as you know, demanded uh, the rapid support forces to join them and to basically to, um, to submit. And that's where the division started because the rapid support forces said they wouldn't. But that was an inter-military issue not a civilian issue. The civilians by that stage were largely pushed aside. And so the, re the real interesting question uh, for Sudan looking forward is whether or not the civilian side can, can sustain its organization and its preparation for a transition and for a constitutional process because the military's goal has been to sideline it and weaken it, and it succeeded. Thank you. Uh, I think Estat wanted to say something. No, I'm going to talk in Arabic. Is is it working? Um, uh, you... Yes, let me uh, maybe shut down my yes, translation. Yes, I can see it. I think that in Sudan, it's not possible to fight قسمة السلطة ولا الثروة بس للأسف لو نحن محتاجين نعمل حل يكون هو حل ننجز اتفاق فيه يكون تغاسم السلطة والثروة يعني بطريقة أحسن ما يكون يعني لكن كل الأطراف متعودة في كل الاتفاقيات في كل الفترات في السودان إنه يكون دي الطريقة اللي بنعو بها اتفاق سياسي ثم دستور انتقالي المعضلة الثانية هو كيف نعمل دستور دائم اللي هي العملية الكاملة عملية المشورة وأنا في بلاسي بيجي برضو التجربة الكينية أفتكر إنها تجربة ممكن السودانيين يستفيدوا منها كثير بس بنحتاج إنه يكون عندنا وثيقة سابقة نعتمد عليها وبرضو يكون في مشاورات أفتكر المجتمع المدني ممكن يلعب دور كبير لأنه في السودان حاليا للأسف برضو في مشكلة بتاعة سغة ما حيقدروا يسقوا في الأطراف السياسية الحالية فأفتكر هو ممكن يكون جزء محايد يعني اشتغل على مرحلة صناعة الدستور والمشاورات وممكن تكون بعد الجمعية الدستورية هي اللي بتبقى البرلمان أو العكس عشان يتم يعني المصادقة على على الدستور الدائم أو البرلمان في الحالة الثانية هو اللي يشرع بأنه يكون مراغب للعملية السياسية دي إلى أن يتم صناعة لكن إحنا حاليا محتاجين نتكلم أكثر في موضوع كيف نحن نعمل دستور دائم لا بعد الممكن كل الناس يحترموا كل الأطراف تجتمع عليها وده برضو بيوديني للأطراف الثانية اللي الآن ما انضمت أي عملية بتاع السلام زي الحركة الشعبية لتحرير السودان عبد العزيز الحلو عبد الواحد محمد نور في واحدين بخطوا شروط إنهم دايرين مبادئ فوق دستورية يعني ما دايرين يدخلوا في مرحلة من دون يقوم فيها البداية مع المجموعات السياسية الأخرى مثلا زي قوى الحرية والتغيير أو الجزء العسكري لأنهم برضو للآن في صراعات أكيد بين الجهات دي فأفتكر صناعة الدستور هي ممكن تكون مدخل للمشكلة Would anyone like to comment on what Asat just said? Was the translation clear? More or less. If can, can you hear me? So I I think I mean the the, the issues she she raised have primarily to do with um, how potentially civil society could contribute at the level of what Kafana would say would 
referred to as the second stage, which is the permit, so to say, constitution making process. And um, uh, is that referred to also to the idea of having these constitutional or super constitutional principles and perhaps a map has Murray again, because South Africa did have that and because it was raised in the round table and there was interest as to exactly what those could look like and perhaps how to guarantee that they would be upheld in that process toward a permanent constitution, it would be worth commenting on. You want me to come in? Sorry, I missed a bit of that because for some reason um, I couldn't get the original transmuted, so I was, was struggling to hear a bit. But so let me come in and I apologize if I don't follow up, up fully. Just directly on the South African constitutional principles, they were a deal. Um, the story was a tiny bit of what Andrew was talking about, but nothing like it. We had a professional army that once things were going to change, it by and large went with the change. That is very different from the kind of conflict he was referring to, and as I understand the conflict in Sudan. So we were a different situation. Let me just emphasize that. But nonetheless, there were people who stood to lose a considerable amount if a majority government came in and made a new constitution. And they were the people who controlled the army and the police forces. So they were not going to go with the deal unless they were given some real security in the future. And what, in my view, was a sort of brilliant um, solution was the solution of having binding constitutional principles before an election and then an elected constitutional assembly that was to produce a constitution, but was bound by the principles. And then as you've all said, actually those principles were the obvious things and a whole lot of matters for us, what was important was that we would have basically a federal system of government. And that was very contested, but it was um, agreed in the principles. So the Constitutional Assembly had no choice about that matter. But the question then always is, how on earth do you trust that deal to be honored after the election? Um, and in fact, it remains amazing to me that it was trusted that it would be honored. And I think the answer may be, well, the device was that um, our new top court would have the responsibility of certifying whether or not the constitution adopted by the Constitutional Assembly indeed complied with those principles. Did it honor those principles or did it not? So that sort of all sounds quite simple. You just get a court to do the job. But of course, in most countries, you know, who would trust the judiciary to that extent? I mean, I can think of almost nowhere else I've worked. You wouldn't even do it in the United States now, as, you know, long-standing democracy. So it's slightly amazing to me that South Africans, white South Africans trusted a future yet to be appointed court. And there are reasons you can give. So the question I suppose in other situations is, are there other ways of, if you do have a deal like this, it's going to be fragile. Are there other ways of getting principles um, checked? Huh? One May second, Tina, I'm sorry. Could someone mute themselves, please? Sorry for that. No, that's okay. So, I mean, I don't, again, it, it would be interesting to hear whether other people have any ideas. I mean, I often think of, you know, can you have international guarantors? Um, history of international guarantors the little I know of it hasn't been very good. Um, they quite reluctantly come in to, to actually do these things, but you could imagine, a, I suppose, perhaps a regional court of some sort. I mean, are there ways of managing this? One would have to think creatively. And going back to some earlier comments, it's, I mean, I find it, I find it emotionally quite difficult to think about what a constitution might look like or a process might look like while you're in the midst of a war. But if you've had some of these ideas now, it can be helpful if you can sort of put up ideas at, at the time. And I see Andy has views on this too. I was just going to say uh, something that you know so well, um, uh, but that uh, others might not, which is the reason why both sides trusted a constitutional court was that it wasn't the old court. They set up a new court and the process was going to be 
uh, broadly regarded as putting people on it who were trusted by both sides. And it worked. In other words, they established a new body trusted by all sides to reach the decision as to whether or not the constitutional principles had been complied with by the Constitutional Assembly. And I think for somewhere like Sudan, that's a crucial point, that if you wish to have uh, uh, some checking process, it must be one that you believe in. And, uh, and in South Africa, they made up a new one. And, and it worked. It was trusted and it worked, and not least um, uh, because it had these extraordinary personalities on it. If I add to that, Andy, just to clear a bit of the South African debate between us, when I first knew Andy, he was in South Africa. Um, but South Africa also had a sort of odd respect for law. I mean, despite having some of the most horrible laws in the world, um, it did follow law and it had judges who kind of felt they needed to make decisions that complied with laws and so on. So we got an exceptional court that was more or less trusted. Um, but we also had a population that kind of believed in courts. So it, 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 it's more than just having the right judges because I don't think you would have got the rank and file of say ANC supporters particularly happy when the court, in fact, threw out the first draft of the constitution, if it had not been that actually courts were considered able to make this kind of decision. So it's a whole package of things, which goes right to Andy's, Andrew's point. Um, what body might be trusted to be, the, to be the determining body? Where would you find one? Um, how would you put it together? Would it be just to go to go back for a moment to something that's quite often talked about in this context is a Kenyan constitution making process. Now I had the remarkable honor of being a member of the committee that drafted the Kenyan constitution. Why might you ask is a South African sitting on that committee? And I think the answer is, there were three foreigners out of nine people. The answer simply is that the Kenyans didn't trust each other enough. As you know, their tribal divides are very deep and foreigners they thought was a way of ensuring a more trustworthy process. So that's another example. Um, there must be more. I think that um, it's, it's certainly um, gotten very interesting, but perhaps this is also the perfect moment to transition into Andrew's presentation and get into power sharing and also guarantees that could accompany any power sharing arrangements during the transition. Andrew, if you allow me briefly, let me just introduce you to uh, our participants in Arabic briefly, and then you can get started. Um, and then, um, Dr. Ladli, uh, he also has a long time as a member of the country and a member of the country, especially in the areas of the election وشارك أيضا من خلال الأمم المتحدة في الوساطة المتعلقة بالترتيبات الدستورية وعمل وله خبرة طويلة في كمبوديا وجنوب أفريقيا وغامبيا وطمور الشرقية وأيضا في ظل أو في إطار عمليات سلام والوساطة في شرق أوسط أفريقيا وجنوب شرق آسيا إذا أندرو بيز جو هيد would you like to um, uh, share a presentation? Uh, thank you. And as I uh, greet everyone, could I just ask, I see that the screen sharing has been disabled yeah. by, by uh, you. So if I could just uh, put up a, sure. a couple uh, of slides. But Bashir, could you please um, make Andrew co-host? Just... Um, have you, have well, you been made co-host? Um, let's see. Um, Should work now. Okay, all right. Um, hopefully you can see that. So uh, in my greeting, uh, allow me please to, to echo uh, Catherine's uh, gratitude for being here and uh, Christina's. And, um, and thank you uh, so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm... I'm looking at this uh, concept of uh, the possible role and risk of power Andrew, sharing. Andrew, we don't see your, uh, your, your screen. Ah. 
Um, now? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm uh, looking at the, the possible role and risk uh, of power sharing because actually of the key point that uh, was in both Catherine and, and uh, Christina's paper and, the, and their comments, which is uh, the, the notion of path dependency. That if you look back on, on what was done in the past, it's likely that that will be repeated. In other words, that somehow what's happened in the past dominates and controls the decisions that are made in the future. And the big risk in that I saw when I came to put this paper together is that um, is that if you keep doing what you've always done, you get what you got before. So I a quick overview. I've got very few slides. Um, there's two versions of this paper. One is very long, which has got all the references, and one is just a 10-page summary. Um, and, uh, and for those uh, who, who have got the time to, to comment and to help me make this a better paper, I'd be extremely grateful for comments. Uh, the second point in my overview is that this is a big field, but I think the issues are ultimately practical. Why and how might any of what I call the tools of power sharing help? Um, might they? Why might they work and why might they fail? Uh, in this situation with this history in Sudan, I think it's important to be clear that power sharing tools are not something that you can just take off a menu. Power sharing tools are active forces in themselves. They they affect what gets done. They shape decisions. They shape incentives. Uh, they produce surprises. Uh, often people use something from the toolkit of power sharing, and it produces a completely different response. And so it's really interesting and important when you look at comparative examples is to look at how the power sharing tools have shaped that particular society. What happened? Not just what was the theory, what happened? And the risks give us learning. And the key process for me about power sharing is one of adaptation. In other words, it's a very active process. You can't simply use the tools of power sharing and think that, that thereafter you can leave everything and it will just happen. It's not like delivering a perfect meal in a restaurant. You can't just choose something and it will work. It has its own life force power sharing. Well, okay, the third point. At any uh, point in a notional sequence that you might have, which is you've got a current war, a possibility of a ceasefire, transition, durable settlement, the key question in power sharing is going to be who is going to be at a table? Who's who makes the decision about which of these tools are going to be used? Um, and that takes you to, a, for me, a, an extremely simple model that I think is very, is, is, is very helpful. I think it's, used to, it's useful to think about the table that you need your fighters because you need them to agree to put down their weapons. My analogy in this model is of a building that you need, that your fighters break the building. They break the processes, they break the economy, they break buildings, they break people, they break lives. Builders, in contrast, the whole goal if in a transition is that you need somebody to do something different. You need to rebuild. So the key questions, you need your fighters, you need your builders, and of course you need plans for how to do that. That's Those plans, like an architect's plans for redrawing a house, those are the plans for your transition. Those are your plans for your Juba peace agreements. Those are your plans for your new constitution. Those are your plans for your constitutional principles. So the key question is who's going to be involved in that? And then I put in here, plus you've got what are notionally your external players. They're notionally off stage but they dramatically affect the decisions of these people, of the fighters, if they've been arming them and supporting them. 
and they might affect the decision of these players, the builders, and, and they might affect the plans. A classic example of this is in Libya, where you can't really think of it as being a domestic process because it is so dramatically shaped by the offstage externals. The Libyan parties that are being influenced uh, by Turkey and others can't make decisions on their own. That was exactly the same in the Syria process. The Libya uh, uh, parties that are being influenced um, by Egypt and others can't make decisions on their own. And, um, and you have, so your model as to who's going to be at the table needs at least to contemplate getting your fighters, as Christina said, getting your builders, and that must include your key political leaders, as well as the wider issues that we were talking about. If you want a society which isn't going to be governed by the past, you need some of the forces that shape the decisions for change to be involved. And who's going to form the, uh, the plans? All right. That's just an overview. And if you were to take nothing else away from these papers, the takeaway that's most simple is that if your future power sharing focuses only on rival fighters who are going to share power, the result is likely to be fighting. In other words, and Sudan's past has primarily entrenched the fighters in its next processes. The people with the closest access to military force have been those that have been entrenched and institutionalized in the process. And by the way, the Juba Peace Agreement, despite its agreement, its uh, promises, um, basically does that. Well, the contents of these papers uh, that I present, long and short, these are... Uh, these are the, the seven points, and I'll extremely quickly go through them. The purpose of the paper, of course, is to assist uh, this kind of discussion. It's, it's, it's offered with, I, I hope, the same uh, 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 humility of, uh, that an outsider should bring. Uh, these are issues that I, I study, I read about, I, uh, I look at comparatively. But the, the agony and the pain and the extraordinary uh, uh, problems and, um, and pain of, of Sudan's civil war uh, makes any contribution like this, I hope, um, should be suitably humble. These are really hard issues, but I hope it's possible to contribute to the discussion. The power-sharing field is broadly uh, aimed at, at trying to ensure that there's representation of politically relevant groups and um, in the process. Um, it's broadly trying to say that if you're, if you're mobilized as a group, you, uh, it, it, the basic idea of power sharing is that there should be some way that you're involved in the processes. And in particular, in, in access to decision-making and in access to power. So in broad uh, uh, terms, this field is divided between systems that try and ensure representation, and in broad terms, leave it then to the participants to claim their stake, and systems that broadly say we want to try and get as much cooperation as possible between different groups in the society. So we're going to structure our tools so that all sides are at a table and we're going to try and ensure that they cooperate because if they don't cooperate, you can't have a government. That sort of division but in the power sharing field between those that want representation and those that's, that want cooperation is one of the big divisions in the power sharing field. Most of the, the, uh, the focus is on in my view, is in, 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 in conflict situations, is on the group representation, is trying to ensure that your fighters and your builders are at the table and that you get a wide enough representation of the different groups at the table such that they will own the result. The democratic theory behind this is actually very common sense, which is that if you're involved in the process, you're likely to be uh, uh, to believe in it and to participate in it and to stick with it, even if a particular decision goes against you. Now, anyway, that's the the power sharing field, and there's a lot of material in the paper. 
I think it's important to look at the sequence leading to the current crisis and why the transition failed, because I think it helps us understand uh, this path dependency and uh, that that both our previous speakers focused on, which is that your past tends to dominate what you do in the present. The sequence that led to the current crisis it depends upon how far back you go. But I think each one of the various settlements that you look back in the past uh, has had an enduring effect on Sudan's present. The one that uh, that I particularly start with is the conditions which produced the coup that brought Bashir to power and um, and then at the various uh, settlements and and uh, and so on that followed after that uh, including which led to the the uh, the comprehensive peace agreement of 2005 the separation of South Sudan and then the various things that 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 started in 2019 and have led to the current crisis. The key thing for me uh, about those is that, uh, is that each of them gives us lessons. Why did they fail and, and what forces uh, produced uh, 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 violence continuing as opposed to why did they fail in the sense that they, uh, of their ambition to produce peaceful governance? Why did they fail in that? They, each of them succeeded in temporarily stopping a particular phase of the war but in fact, Sudan's current dreadful war is the result of that sequence. That sequence has not produced its ambition of peaceful governance. It's produced just the, the worst, so the worst war in Sudan's history. Well, how might the war end is an extremely important point in judging which parties might claim to be able to share power. And for that, the extremely simple scenarios are... Uh, of course, that one party wins, that uh, that there's a protected war, or that there's a political settlement. And those, uh, going into the details of those, uh, is important because, because of who the external parties are, because of the, of the extraordinary uh, dominance of, um, of one of the conflict parties in one of the major states or areas of regions of Sudan, and because of its access, uh, that's the rapid support forces, to a pool of funds which don't depend upon state taxation and state revenue. That's the gold in Darfur, uh, completely controlled by the rapid support forces. Uh, that's the, so the, uh, that gold has been uh, translated into significant arms flows, including from the UAE and from Russia's uh, paramilitary uh, Wagner group, and indeed into support from neighboring countries. So how might the war end is an extremely important part of thinking how your power might be shared, which parties are going to claim and of course, what might affect your constitutional process. All of these things join up. And thinking about those scenarios is important. Um, the Economist uh, magazine, not a radical publication, in its latest edition, uh, points out that um, the Sudan Armed Forces are currently uh, being backed by, uh, by Iran and by Iranian drones. And... Um, and uh, uh, and that has helped them to achieve significant battlefield gains. Uh, the rapid support support forces are being backed by those externals I mentioned, and that has seen their uh, uh, their su uh, support. This war uh, looks as if it can go on very substantially. Um, it's important to uh, to apply to move on to point five to apply to apply a power sharing lens to look at the past and to, to contemplate how might it be the power that you can move towards civilian and peaceful governance. In the past, the power sharing lens uh, has included war actors primarily and has led to more war and has institutionalized violent actors in power, which has institutionalized violence. That's the simple takeaway 
that uh, that I draw out in point five of this paper. I then uh, go to specific issues, uh, which I'll look at in the next slide. And then I have concluding thoughts in the paper, which is nine key risks, which focuses on the capacity and the systems, particularly if there's to be civilians, to try to manage any future transition to civilian rule, the capacity of those, uh, uh, those issues. Now, I was only going to discuss these specific issues if I had time. I, I think I've got a, a, a time to quickly mention the specific issues part of this paper, which I'll give this slide to, and it's my last. These are the four specific issues that I was asked particularly to make sure that my paper commented on, so I give them a separate heading. The first was managing the military-civilian arrangements post-conflict. As I say here, the term post-conflict assumes that there's going to be a separate process for ending a war. In other words, the war will end. And then for this so-called two-phase process, either uh, to, to decide on what's going to be the transitional arrangements or on decide on what's going to be the eventual settlement in a sub subsequent transition. Now, our, our, um, our question there is, is really to look at why the 2019 arrangements failed. This is exactly what they tried to do. The 2019 arrangements tried to manage these arrangements and to say we're going to end uh, many of the conflicts. The same thing, by the way, with the, um, the Juba Peace Agreement. Its whole purpose was to end one aspect of a war. Um, one of the few conflict parties that I met, by the way, and when I was doing mediation work, was this guy, Mini Manawi. Um, I met him in, in, uh, in Uganda. But um, he, who's, uh, of course, this, uh, the Juba Peace Agreement, one of the key elements is to end that aspect of the war. Well, managing the military-civilian arrangement post-conflict, our what we can look at is to say, why did those arrangements fail? Um, why did they fail? They failed. The immediate proximate cause was because the Sudan armed forces tried to get the rapid support forces to agree to unify into one armed force in a process of two years. And the rapid uh, support forces said no. And they, at that point, it was quite clear that they had substantial backing, substantial forces. And as the Sudan armed forces closed in on them, they took action. And that started the war slowly and so on. The bigger uh, uh, reason why this failed is because it became, it became quite clear that actually the Sudan armed forces and the rapid support forces that had staged the coup and um, uh, earlier had in fact not really agreed to hand over to civilian rule. These transitional arrangements were transitional, and um, and but their purpose was uh, was really to uh, reduce the pressures from the street and to gradually enable a process of regaining control. And um, and so when you look at this managing these arrangements post-conflict, that's going to be a critical question. Do the armed forces actually say, look, we cannot govern on our own. We need to hand over to civilian power. Or do they believe, as the military does in Egypt, that actually they should stay in power? And, um, and so there's a critical question there as to, as to whether or not the armed forces singly or together actually agree to hand over power. So addressing the power sharing questions, um, of course, here I just raise these questions, which elements of power, executive power, judicial, um, legislative power, which when you've got power sharing, all of your tools go, uh, look at different elements of uh, the institutions of power. Is this to be some kind of um, uh, uh, proportional representation uh, of regions is this to be is this to be legislative representation are you essentially trying to say that i'm going to give executive power between the two principal conflict parties 
which is what was done in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Two conflict parties, both one vice president, one president. That's what they meant. So between who, to what end, using what mechanisms, and so on. I focus here on the need for dispute resolution because uh, it is one of the critical questions that emerged uh, in uh, it, it is one of the critical questions that emerges in all power sharing that this issue, as I said, is dynamic. It's not a neutral process where you choose the mechanism. It dramatically affects what happens between the parties. What do you do when there's a dispute? The war in South Sudan really developed, in my view, partly because of this question, that as the situations um, changed um, and as it became clear that, that one or other of the parties may no longer have the same access to power and resources, that there was no mechanism for resolving that and the parties went back to war. One of the critical questions in power sharing is the practicality of how it works. Most people agree to share power, but then in fact have almost no rules and mechanisms as to how it's going to work. In Afghanistan, there was a power sharing agreed between the elected president and the, the person who claimed he, uh, that they, he should have been elected. Uh, but there was absolutely no mechanism to, to, to describe how that was going to work. How do, you, how do you share power between two executives? other than simply having each of them create their own little empire and try to govern their own bits that they can. The whole questions of cabinet government, of shared of rules for power sharing, rules for decision-making, of allocation of resources, those practicalities are absent in almost all power sharing. It's as if you agree a headline agreement that there's going to be a legislature and then you do nothing else. How's the legislature going to work? The legislatures need standing orders and rules and systems. There's the capacity to, to make decisions and there's the preparation of that capacity that I've alluded to. These are guarantees to be included in an interim post child sharing between the warring parties. Um, I come back to these questions. Uh, could the tra transition have been protected from military overthrow? And could Sudan have avoided this current war? If you can answer that, I think you can you can answer uh, some of these questions as to what guarantees you can get. And that's a big discussion. And then lastly, uh, discussions from the region. I'm just going to point very quickly at lessons in half a sentence on each. In Cyprus, your lesson is that when you build power sharing into your constitution, if you make it too rigid, the constitution will fail. If the bamboo cannot bend in the wind, it will break. That's what broke the Cyprus constitution power sharing from 1960. One of the lessons from Lebanon is that if you uh, use power sharing to end the conflict, it may become a permanent feature of your political life and you can never get away from it. And in Lebanon, what it enabled is the militarization of one of the, one of the parties into being by far the most powerful force in Lebanon and the most powerful, one of the most powerful armed forces in the region and one of the most significant proxies for the expansion of, political, of, of armed force power from Iran in the whole of the Middle East. So the Lebanon power sharing deal, in fact, enabled a very substantial change to Lebanon's political organization. It didn't just share power between them, it created an entire new set of events. I like the example from Yemen in, in, at the end of the Cold War in 1991 of power sharing. When the, the North and South uh, united, they united peacefully in about three days, and they agreed to share power 50-50 between them, North and South, and then there were going to be elections. Those elections completely wiped out the South. The South, from being 50-50 in a share of power, went to zero. And that meant it had no future in a future power sharing arrangement. And so they went back to war. And uh, that war, they were eventually destroyed. And, um, and, uh, 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 and that the whole Southern question as to what to do with the South has never been settled. So I like that example. But in fact, every example that you look at from Yemen 
in terms of power sharing has got lessons, including from the present, but that will take me too long, and indeed from the past, uh, by the way, the, um, but um, going right back to the 1962 coup. Libya's current uh, power sharing questions, and indeed the attempt to move uh, into a joint government that would progress to elections. The simple lesson, there's many, many lessons from Libya, including external parties. But in terms of power sharing, the lesson I want to highlight is that if you've got no mechanism for continuing the transition, your, tr your interim parties hang on to power. And that's what they've done. They have scuttled every single deal to try to move forward, and they're still semi-power. In other words, the power sharing that was meant to be an interim process has, in fact, entrenched a transition to end, and has so far meant that they cannot get out of it. I like uh, the example of Somalia because its power sharing bases all of its power on clan representation in Somalia itself, its interim process. That has, um, that has, uh, uh, that's still the case. It's, it's going to be uh, an interesting question as to whether and ever or not they can break out of it. And I like mentioning Somaliland, this little group uh, from the north of Somalia, which broke off in 1992 and declared its independence, never been recognized. I like its example because they took a decision to prohibit clan representation as the basis for its political power sharing. Instead, what they did was to say that there would only ever be three parties that could compete for power. They couldn't be clan-based, and those three parties were going to be the three parties that had won the most votes at the previous um, local government election, and that for 10 years, those would be the only parties that could then compete, and then the process would begin again. You'd have local government elections, parties could compete, and so on. That process, by the way, is in a crisis now because the sequence of, of, uh, of how to choose those three parties uh, has broken down and so they've one group saying let's keep the same parties and test the next elections another one saying no no we need new political parties but anyway what's interesting for me is that uh, it's a choice as to how to structure power which tries to break the hold of clans on uh, on somalia's political um, power so uh there's thousands of examples. Um, I just simply pointed these with one sentence lessons. And I'm sorry, uh, I went on too long. No, that was that was um, great, Andrew. Uh, loads of food for thought. Uh, I'm still taking in it myself. Uh, I'm wondering if any of uh, our Sudanese participants may have immediate comments or questions. If nothing immediate comes to mind, uh, I will, Andrew, as I did earlier, uh, refer to some questions that came up uh, during the round table. Um, we did address the question of power sharing and what quickly uh, emerged in the discussion is that it wasn't necessarily clear whether we were discussing power sharing arrangements as a necessary tool or mechanism, so to say, out of conflict, or whether we were discussing power sharing arrangements as a desirable and desired long-term constitutional arrangement, so to say, and whether if one out of need resorts to power sharing in the short term, that kind of inevitably leads to some kind of power sharing arrangement in the long term. So I think uh, part of what we struggled with in that conversation was as to the, the, the very purpose with which power sharing to begin with is resorted to. And whether, as I said, uh, there's an inevitable risk in perpetuating power sharing just because at some point it is a necessity. So I don't know if you can maybe yeah say something about that before we take other questions or comments. Okay. Um, it's a an extremely uh, good question, of course, and and um, as I as I try to say in my um, in this in this simple model 
of 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 uh, power sharing uh you you need your fighters at the table in order to stop uh the fighting they have to agree and then the question is who else do you get to the table and how do you structure how there's going to be competition for power the power sharing tools try to ensure group representation and the mechanisms that they use are broadly either elite deals or or um, or representation through electoral systems broadly those are the the broad areas that you look at so electoral systems will produce political groups and other groups but you might have to structure that to ensure that you get women or that you get uh, this particular clan or that you don't leave out this particular group that uh, that there can be some kind of representation and how you structure those electoral systems is a crucial uh, question as to who ends up in power if your electoral system systematically disadvantages one group a minority group then it will have no stake in the process and if you leave them out and there's no mechanism for them ever to be in power then what you get very often is that they either abandon the political process or they return to war if they were a former armed group the sudan the comprehensive peace agreement in sudan uh, in 2005 the criticism of that agreement is very profound it entrenched only two principal parties uh, the SPLA, spLM um, and uh, South uh, sorry the, the Sudan uh, Liberation Movement and the Sudan Liberation Army the Sudan People's Liberation Army it entrenched them and it entrenched the Bashir government it left out all the other regional conflicts at the time this was a deliberate choice was to say let's try and solve the south first and let's not solve all the other ones that choice is to leave out all of those groups and not include them in a transition uh, arguably led to genocide in Darfur because it enabled the then government of Khartoum to deploy all of its forces because it didn't have to fight in the south anymore in uh, in Darfur and so the genocide in Darfur and the continuation of all of the other conflicts, in, uh, including the ones that were addressed in the Juba peace agreement um, uh, most recently, all of those other conflicts were left out. And the whole notion that we need to settle Sudan's conflicts got put aside in favor of a power sharing deal. So the, the, the issues as to whether or not you need to have some parties to uh, to an interim agreement in fact uh, shaped the whole of sudan the the 2005 agreement shaped the rest of sudan's history and any possibility of of actually solving the whole regional conflicts that was available at the time got pushed aside that was a decision of the mediators and it was a decision of the principal parties so my um uh, my view on all of this is is that the reason these issues are critical and important as was raised in your discussion um tomorrow in your previous discussions is is because the history says that if you get this wrong it's likely to have a very very enduring effect on your future processes this this is that's ultimately path dependency it's not just that you it's not just that you your choices look like the same in your past it's that you shape the choices of actors the decisions that you make are themselves uh, active forces in shaping the future and um and uh, so that's why this, this needs such careful thought um, but you look as if you're about to say something more tomorrow absolutely not i i just appreciate very much um what you offered in terms of a response. And I think we have um, Selma and Adib who wanted to say something, and also Aziad, who's a colleague from Tunisia who was at the round table. So Selma, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Tamar, and thank you, Andrew, for this very extensive paper. 
Um, I think I just have a few comments to make here. Um, I think what really needs to also be considered or paid attention to is the complexities or the divisions within the Sudanese army itself at the moment. Um, it's well known that, you know, the Sudanese army is so continuously representative of the Bashir regime that the revolution worked on ousting. Um, and, and, you know, that is still causing a lot of complexities within the Sudanese people and a lot of mistrust. And, you know, leading up to this process of the war, the Sudanese army was very much representative of the Bashir regime. Uh, even during the GPA, uh, peace or the peace agreement itself that happened, people were very reluctant to kind of put their trust within the army or whether the army will ensure, you know, any kind of transitional process, transitional just sorry, transitional justice process to take place. And this is what led to the war that, you know, even the um, rapid support forces were mistrusting the army to lead or to ensure the power sharing processes. So I think, you know, with the army still very much being at the center of any peace process or being involved in, it, in any peace process, it is being seen that the Bashir regime that we worked on ousting for the past 30 plus years, it is still at the very forefront of Sudanese politics and Sudanese democracy. So for the Sudanese people to, again, feel that, you know, this process of reaching a peace agreement and ending this current war, this is really something that, you know, really needs to be paid attention to and really be considered whether the army itself can sit at a table and be responsible for leading a peace process, let alone a constitutional process. This is one point I wanted to make. The other point I wanted to make is that, you know, the rapid support forces is the child basically of the Sudanese army. It was formed by the Bashir regime. The um, rapid support forces are now the ones who are fighting the Bashir regime. So basically it is them turning against the their mothers basically. So I think for this process of the war I've seen in your paper, kind of what is next or how this process of the war will end, I don't see that a peace process inclusive of both parties will happen. I don't see that both parties will sit at a table and reach an agreement to end the war. This is something that I think is very complex and it's, you know, something I think beyond what the Sudanese people are seeing. I think it's a disagreement amongst them that is continuously going to happen. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, as I mentioned in my previous comment on Christina and Catherine's paper, is So people to one, I think, can, can you hear me well? Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. So I think, you know, for us, the, this revolution, it took, I would say, 30 plus years to happen. That the Sudanese people were fighting for the revolution for such a long time. And again, there's a huge loss of momentum and huge disappointed disappointment sorry, that happened among the Sudanese people in how the transition happened. Um, so for this process to take place again, I think the Sudanese people are now, you know, fighting famine, we're fighting a war, we're fighting other priorities. So how can we as civil society actors, how can we as INGOs, how can we as acad academ academias, et cetera, et cetera, really work with and support the Sudanese people to entrust another transitional process, let alone build up towards building our own constitution? So I think, how can we prioritize or ensure the prioritizing of this process within any upcoming um, transitional process? And, and I hope my comments made sense there. Thank you, Andrew, again. Would you like me to say something quickly or should we take more sure, questions? Sure, sure, please, please. please go ahead. Um, okay, the, uh, thank you, the um, very uh, thoughtful comments. In terms of the complexities of the Sudanese army and the reason I don't trust it. I, I simply add into the process that the UAE is not supporting the RSF because uh, it likes them. It's supporting them because it believes that the Sudan army is still closely aligned with the Islamist political forces that basically uh, were used by Turabi and to bring uh, Bashir to power. 
And so what the UAE is very nervous about and Saudi Arabia is a revival of an armed um, Islamist, political Islamist movement taking power again in Sudan. That's the reason they're supporting uh, the rapid support forces. And um, uh, in addition to whatever uh, revenue they get from from laundering the gold, which primarily goes through uh, the UAE, all of this is 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 documented in these footnotes uh, that explain where where I and how I make those those calculations. So uh, the important uh, point uh, that you raise on this is exactly how it is going to be possible to contemplate these two armed forces working together again. They have gone at each other's throats in the most violent way, and and they've gone at, at Sudan's civilian population. And it's extremely hard to see them saying, look, brother, you know, kind of let's just be armed forces together again, and let's put this aside. It's extremely hard. Uh, but in the absence of a victory by one, um, a negotiated outcome is uh, uh, is you know kind of the only thing that one can really see emerging. Um, it it's extremely hard, despite the battlefield gains that drones have brought to the Sudan armed forces. It's extremely hard to see one side winning. But if one side uh, hands over power to the other, that will break the power. Or, or risks breaking the power of um, of either of them, unless they both agree to to leave each other's powers intact. In other words, they'll get back together and say, "We leave Darfur to you. You can keep doing what you're doing in Darfur, and we're not going to account for your massacres of civilians, nor indeed for your previous genocidal role as the Janjaweed. We're not going to look at that." And we leave you, the Sudan Armed Forces, by and large, in political control and in control of the areas of the economy. And let's just agree to that. If the two armed forces agree to that, that is power sharing between the two armed forces. It's not pretty, but it might end the war. And it almost certainly will preclude any handover to, to civilian rule. So that's a deal between the two of them, which is, which is very hard to contemplate as a as a, a an actor con, uh, wanting civilian and peaceful transition it's the two military agreeing to share power between them but um uh, so i i I, uh, I agree completely that about the lack of trust and that's going to be one of the central questions for a ceasefire and for the transitional arrangements and for the future how to support the sudan people um is i think one of the big challenges of, our, uh, uh, of not just uh, for those that are most closely involved, such as you, uh, in, in this, but it, I think it's one of the big questions for the international community. You know, because of Gaza, Sudan has moved off the center page, but the statistics from Sudan continue to be just terrible. I mean, this is just this is one of the major crises of the 21st century. You know, it is just huge. And um, and uh, the fact that the sort of war uh, leaves the, the front pages, uh, I think does mean that we should do our best to somehow keep uh, the issues at the forefront of international concern. And as for supporting those people involved, it's a very humbling question. Um, I know a number of people who were strong activists and who I met. Uh, those that have survived have all left the country and and they are just struggling and hanging on. So it's a very humbling question. And, and I hope that there's in some way that we can be practical other than just lending support. So uh, that was uh, uh, Selma, I, I hope I... Uh, I, I, I answered your, your question, or at least I, I hope I responded to your very good comments. Um, I'm sorry yes, there's Andrew, others. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Dr. Ajib, please go ahead. Fadal. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for the great uh, presentation and the information. 
and indeed the idea I really like, uh, love uh, your wisdom of uh, if you keep doing uh, you'll get what you have done uh, I think uh, your presentation gave me a lot of things to think about uh, first I think power sharing and uh, confidence building since there is lack of trust or no trust not only between the conflicting parties, but also among others, then power sharing might be a little bit uh, difficult and it needs to be uh, considered on how to build the confidence between the actors. <clears throat> uh, it might take the uh, way or the avenue of uh, a deal, a special deal between the armies themselves, but the ground reality is different. And that is the, the second point of identity of uh, the uh, division. Uh, power sharing in divided society might be uh, a little bit difficult, uh, taking into account the fragmentation of identity and then power sharing. Looking at the RSF, the RSF is no longer one group, different RSF. The RSF in Darfur, they have their own agenda. The RSF in Jazeera, they do have their other agenda. Uh, the RSF in, uh, in Kurdufan, they are fighting for their own agenda and so on. But it's not only the RSF, even SAF itself is also divided, the civil society, ordinary people. Uh, political parties, ex-rebel group who just signed the Juba peace agreement, now they are divided uh, into uh, two or three uh, uh, group, group uh, supporting the rapid support forces, others are supporting the uh, the military, and and so so I think uh, in this kind of divided society and this uh, fragmentations of identity. Uh, the power sharing might need to be uh, taken a certain way, whereby uh, also confidence building is necessary or essential. My last uh, uh, question or comment for both of them is about uh, the women inclusion in the peace processes and power sharing. Theoretically, uh, even in the in the uh, Previous uh, attempt, uh, there is a power sharing in, in paper, but in reality, there is no power sharing. And I think uh, it might be better to have a clear regulation on the inclusion of women uh, for all peace processes and, uh, and then and the power uh, sharing. So the issue of uh, of this woman, woman inclusion, I think, is essential in in the peace processes and also uh, power sharing. But uh, I really like the presentation and the, and the great information uh, that you share with us. I wish you the best to develop uh, this uh, great paper. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doctor Deeb. I just. Uh... A very quick two very quick comments um, um on the confidence building yes exactly um it's going to be a really really interesting question uh, parties that are uh, that have committed terrible things or that have huge access to resources know that if they lose power they lose everything that's their fear that they will be held accountable and so the confidence question um, and the accountability question is going to be uh, they, the two are very close. If you if you uh, ensure if you demand accountability, then uh, parties will be very nervous about settling. But, uh, that's a discussion we had before on the inclusion of women. It was a, actually a part of the paper, and I and I um, I. I didn't do it justice in my presentation. I don't want to 
in any way burden Sudan's women for the responsibility of solving a problem which is primarily, if you can be frank, been caused by Sudan's men, in particular its armed force men. But there is a, a such a strong evidence of participation of, of, of Sudan's women that I asked the question in the paper, I wonder whether to do something completely different, it mightn't be possible to say that if we if we want to avoid a repetition of the past, the only way might be if Sudan's women are at the center of a peace process and of the discussions. And I didn't want to suggest that too strongly because it might look as if I'm burdening them with taking responsibility for fixing the problem. But on the other hand, if, if you don't do something completely different, uh, then the likelihood is is of a continued repetition. And it seemed to me that the suffering is so great and that the arguments for representation are now so strong that that might provide a mechanism of, uh, of breaking through this constant cycle of Sudan, which has seen its current war after all the previous ones. So uh, uh, thank you for, for highlighting that. And I agree totally. Uh, but I hope with I hope with appropriate caution because it's I suggest it, but it's up to Sudan's women to take it up. I'm um, sorry, next speakers. Yes, um, I think we had Ziad, and I think Sami would like to also say something. Selma, is did you raise your hand again, or this is from before? I'm not sure. So please, yes, yes, I. Okay. Sorry, Excellent. I did raise my hand. I think maybe it's just something that I can just follow up with Adib's comment there. Uh, and Andrew's reply to that is that I think in the case of Sudan and continuously, I think, you know, in regards to women representation or the role of women in change, I think, you know, during our revolution, we really saw women at the forefront of the revolution and the revolution was really led by women and youth fully. Um, and unfortunately, you know, from my experience during the transition, working with the transitional government, you know, women were really sidelined, although they led the revolution and youth led the revolution. You know, we really fell back into the trap of, you know, politics or politicians and specifically, you know, traditional politicians being at the forefront of the change in Sudan. And, and and I think, again, that kind of goes back to civil society not being, you know, so strong and well built enough to have worked with the revolutionaries to build, you know, such a strong foundation for this revolution to grow on. So I, I think, you know, and I've, I've continuously said this in different number of platforms is, you know, how can we really ensure that, you know, going forward, we really dig deep and analyze the transition that happened. I think, you know, whether it's IDEA or other organizations, you know, to really do an in-depth study of the transition that happened in Sudan um, and, and just not to kind of find solutions and way forward without really looking into the failures of the transition and really looking at how you know how where the problems were and kind of how to support to to fix those problems and specifically to build on building the capacity of the various actors that le led the revolution so i i just really wanted to draw on both of andrew and adib's comments there in terms of you know not only supporting the role of women alone but to support the role of you know youth movements and ghosts organizations or ghost, ghost movements that really appeared during the revolution. Um, thank you. Andrew, would you like to say uh, anything before before we uh, hand over to Ziad? Uh, no, I agree. Okay. <laughs> Good. So, yeah, Ziad, please go ahead. Thank you, Tamara. Thank, thank you. I wanted to thank you again and thank the Arab Association and the idea for this uh, interesting uh, event after the uh, Uganda round table. Uh, like, it's sad that the situation has not improved since, but uh, we hope so. Uh, I thank Andrew for this comprehensive presentation. I agree almost with everything he said, just I want to uh, put light on uh, uh, the Juba peace agreement. And I think uh, I, I said that in, in Kampala, but and I want to repeat it. I think we have not, uh, uh, we'll say, um, question it too much, the Juba peace agreement. And uh, it's, I think, um, 
you told that uh, it was a tool for peace, but when it was signed, it was not a war in Sudan. Uh, and this is also, we have to ask the motivation for this Juba Peace Agreement and the impact of the Juba Peace Agreement. And the, uh, the Juba Peace Agreement led to a new power sharing after the revolution, which I, I think led to, uh, uh, made uh, the FFC or the part who signed with the military in 2019 weaker, uh, at least at the Sovereignty Council with the new actors. Uh, second thing, uh, the, the Juba Peace Agreement, uh, some uh, actors uh, were not represented, which were very important actors like Al Hilu and others, uh, and others were pre present without having any influence. Third, it created a, a kind of uh, some privilege for Darfur, in the two area regions, and which led to, for example, uh, to um, uh, the east and the north, but especially the east of Sudan, led to some uh, uh, to protest and also to demonstration, and also to block the port. And the, it was a, uh, an increasing reaction in the east, which was one of the reasons to the coup d'etat, it's a series of events. So I think we have to reevaluate uh, like the impact of the Juba Peace Agreement uh, on this power sharing to not do the same mistakes uh, after the conflict. This is just uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Just a very quick uh, conflict, uh, sorry, a response from me about uh, this kind of process which is in some ways it's a mirror of the of the uh, Sudan uh, the 2005 process the comprehensive peace agreement which is that you deal with one area and not with others and you privilege particular actors in one area and not and not address others I, I agree completely I think the it was a it was a, for those people who are watching the transition um, it was a surprise uh, for me, uh, humbly watching this, to suddenly see this con this big peace agreement emerge, privileging particular people in one area, when there are so many issues that still need to be uh, addressed. And um, as you know, that was the choice in the 2005. Um, John Garang said, look, we want to create a new Sudan. That was the phrase. And in fact, to go after all Sudan's problems. And uh, at the center and in all of them, and the SBLL, SBLM stroke A had all these connections with all of those other areas. And, uh, and they were cut off and one issue was settled and the other went, the others continued in war. And uh, so I, I agree. I think that looking at this is an extremely interesting and important uh, issue for for Sudan going forward is this notion of suddenly doing one deal in one area, and um, and and I think it had a big influence on the failure of the um, uh, of the the transition. I I think um, and so. I agree with you completely. Uh, you know more about this than me, but my analysis and reading is extremely supportive of the need to understand this much much better. So it's a very very good point. I'll see if I can say something a bit more about it in the final paper. But more importantly, I think you've put something that's really important on the paper, which is uh, which is really important into the discussion, which is can these sorts of agreements are needed in in each area. But if you just do one, then what you and you get it wrong, you're repeating the patterns of the past. You're entrenching your particular actors uh, in power. Uh, and you're not really building a democratic rule in um, in that area. You're you're entrenching your your power sharing in your power sharing between the centre and um, and the one particular military group or a couple. But then, but you know, I agree. I'm sorry. There's further uh, speakers, so I sh I should let them speak. Um, Sami, did you want to go ahead? Thank you, thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I may go to something that maybe Andrew or uh, Christine also can, can can come on that issue. That is when it comes to the power sharing um, principles that uh, 
And according to our experience in Sudan during the last uh, maybe uh, more than 50 uh, years, that we can see during that time since the uh, Addis Ababa agreement and coming through uh, CBA and after that, uh, including the the agreement in Juba or even during the, uh, the political agreement between the uh, FFC and the military uh, council. So the power sharing usually goes with those who are controlling the, the scene and the final decisions, the final words usually comes from those. Uh, even when we were trying to bring the civilian uh, to the table of Juba peace agreement, usually there is a kind of resistance that usually comes from the rebel groups or from the military side. By, by, by saying that also, you can see that the, uh, the agreement itself uh, usually comes with so many uh, article section and provision that addresses, uh, that address condition, uh, constitutional aspects uh, in, in, this, in this negotiation and later in the this document. So uh, it is, it is, a, uh, it is a, a quite significant that bringing civilian to the table to address the future not only to cease fire, but to address the future of their country. But the situation now, when we come and see the, the current situation and we try to apply the power sharing and as one of the issues that um, anticipated to be part of the, of the, of the, of the issues during the coming uh, peace negotiation. So in the current situation, I can see that is uh, the, the, maybe uh, civilian participation, including women and youth and, and others, uh, and to bring their agenda in the table and try to influence the future of the, the Sudanese uh, future constitution and the future maybe transition, that it will be very hard, especially when we see that it's a, the two parts are actually fighting for the, to control the country. And besides those two, uh, the RSF and SAF, you also can see hundreds of uh, other maybe rebel groups in the four in South Kordofan and Blue Nile are also are waiting and watching this, this situation. And whenever there is a table that uh, will address the future of Sudan, they will come or they will stand uh, side and, 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 and come in some point or so to disrupt the, the future or the, the transition. So this dilemma is there, and also it is a question that needs to be addressed by Sudanese, and also we need to learn from the uh, other experiences. Maybe Andrew can tell us about this, uh, how he was, uh, when he was addressing the issues in, in other countries, but also I think Christina also can give us like some, some, some like uh, experiences, best practices in, in, in Kenya, maybe in, in Yemen, in, uh, and Libya in in all those like national dialogues where people were trying to influence the future constitution to reshape the the transition. That is one of the issues now Sudanese are trying to see how they can become part of that process and to influence the uh, policy uh, makers and to make themselves available and and their uh, their concern already addressed in that uh, that peace uh, process. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll have a, a very quick response. Um, what's interesting about the agreement on core principles um, in South Africa was that it really was the centerpiece of the transition. And, um, and Although you can see lots of high principles in the various agreements in Sudan, uh, particularly the high principles that you can see in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and indeed in the in the Constitution, in fact, it's never been clear to me that there's been agreement on these amongst key actors, uh, including. Um, key civilian actors. And so one of the interesting things for me to talk about is um, 
as an analyst is whether or not there's some kind of process by which Sudan Sudanese might discuss core principles. You know, the um, the coup which brought Bashir to power, as you obviously know more than me, was a coup to prevent the scrapping of the law which required uh, Sharia law to be binding across the whole country. And, um, and that deal had been arranged with uh, John Garang. They said, look, you can't impose Sharia law across the whole South. Uh, but she, uh, I mean, the, the government agreed. Uh, a bill was before Parliament, and the coup that brought Bashir to power took place uh, the day before uh, the law was to be passed. And so, there was, in other words, this was a desperate attempt to keep uh, the centrality of Sharia law, a particular version of it, being applied across the whole country. What's important interesting for me is that that fundamental principle was in fact barely discussed outside of the outside of the um, uh, the narrow peace agreement which had produced I think it was an other Ababa agreement which had produced that that agreement uh, in fact nobody had discussed it in Sudan and the vast uh, bulk of Sudanese uh, religious believers did not believe in the particular, according to the research that I've seen, did not believe in a very conservative view of uh, of Islam. And, and, and there was a wide range of views of, of people's relationship with, uh, uh, with God. And um, that was never discussed. So on fundamental principles about rights, about the kind of society, about the basic values, it does seem to me that those discussions have never been uh, adequately agreed, adequately held, and adequately broadly agreed. There's no, this is really what we want to do. And the core elites that agreed the South African deal, they agreed on that. Absolutely. That was at the centerpiece of what they were going to do. So um, I, I I think it is important that, that, uh, that Sudanese people keep talking about this. The question for me is whether or not there's a forum in which this can be held, and it might be your forum, uh, Tamara, and uh, working with IDEA to focus on can we agree upon what it is really are our basic values? Yes, of course, we are religious, but in what way must that be part of, uh, of the power? And, and does it require a coup d'etat backed by an Islamist political group to ensure that and impose that, and basically then to cause civil war for 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 the whole of Sudan, and um, or is there some peaceful way in which we can find our agreement on basic values? Um, uh, I, I hope that that at least is a commentary, uh, Sami, on your important points, um, and sort of builds on it. Samin, I don't know if uh, you want to add anything. No, thank you, thank you, Andrew, thank you. It, uh, uh, actually, also, I'm trying to not to take the people for longer. If if we can listen from also Catherine or uh, uh, sorry uh, for Catherine or Christina on this uh, issue, it would be great. Maybe just a quick follow up on on Andrew's point. Um, in terms of a dialogue on the principles that might carry such a process, we had quite an interesting experience. Um, over the course of five years, um, it ended in two thousand ten, when we engaged with um at the Max Planck um, Institute Foundation, when we engaged with uh, civil society in Darfur um, to um, have a dialogue about a potential um, peace agreement, a kind of list of demands from the side of the Fourian civil society in terms of the values, in terms of the principles that they would like to see represented in a future peace agreement slash constitution. Um, it was a dialogue that was ongoing over five years, and we met at regular instances to discuss these issues. And it was so interesting to see 
to what degree uh, through these years of dialogue, um, principles really crystallized out of this conversation. And um, it, it it wasn't obvious when they first met that this was going anywhere. Um, it was quite an interesting mix of representatives and um, it, um, it was a process, but it was definitely also a process that clarified a lot of those principles for them um, while they were having this dialogue. And this is something that um, might also be useful in, in, a, in a broader forum in Sudan, because sometimes um, the feeling is there that there, there hasn't been such a dialogue so far and up until now. And so it is not even clear if such principles, if such commonalities do exist. Um, and um, as you said, um, I think there is a need for a forum to provide space for such a discussion to happen, which again is a, a great element of nation building, I believe, um, for um, society to find such principles that they share and want to carry forward. Absolutely. I see uh, one more hand raised. Perhaps we can take one last comment from Thelma, and then I think we can draw this to uh, an end with a few comments and suggestions from my side. Thelma, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Tamara. And please excuse me, everyone, for hijacking the conversation as I did um, during the roundtable. Um, I think I just really want to draw on Catherine's last point. I think, you know, I think over the years, we've really come to know that there's so much division within Sudanese civil society. And, and I think this goes back to the fact that there's so much politics involved within Sudanese civil society. And I think maybe Catherine, you know, working with Max Planck and with, with the research or the or, or this work that you have done, that you've realized that there's so much politics involved within the process that we, we, we do not concentrate on what we should be doing as civil society organizations, yet we always draw back on our political uh, affiliations and our political knowledge. So I think what I would like to kind of see going forward is to also how can we as civil society organizations can kind of address that issue and, and, and how to learn to be civil society organizations, you know, rather than being um, and, and kind of work towards supporting that process rather than sticking to, you know, our guns with our politics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Selma. Um, Andrew, would you perhaps like to conclude before we move forward with just um, final uh, comments? Um, well, from my point of view, just uh, responding partly, I think, to Selma, what struck me, I'm not, I'm not as immersed in Sudan as as many people who I've seen writing on this are, and of course, as Sudan Sudanese are. But what struck me in a personal sense, was just how incredibly political people were. In other words, there's an extremely high level in when you when you visit there of what you might call political intelligence or political involvement. People think about these things a lot, at least in the groups that I met, and maybe because it's so vital in life, and and because so much tragedy has emerged. What what struck me. Uh, just thinking about uh, Selma's view and 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 the the idea of of an ongoing dialogue in some way that it really I think there should be some way of getting more discussion about basic principles because they are so crucial to to Sudan. I think that Sudan has been doing this for eighty years in any way in terms of but one of the things that surely people can now agree, which is that that the consequences of violence are too big and are, are too great, that, that there must be a way of, of, of governing without violence. And um, and so for me, at least, uh, the power sharing issues are, uh, there are tools there, but there are tools for governing without violence. And so far they've been used to ensure violence. So the really interesting question will be, can you, can you find ways of, of discussing how to make decisions in power without violence and break that cycle because it has been an absolutely repetitive cycle and it's caused such tragedy. But 
otherwise just to thank you and for the invitation and to and for for giving me an opportunity to share some thoughts with you and please to wish you well humbly because these are big issues thank you so so much andrew um Catherine, would you like to just say a final word before i also do so no, the same from my side, and I'm sure from Christina's side, we've spent many, many hours discussing these issues while we were writing the paper. And um, we are really also um, humbly looking at the situation and um, the complexity of it. Um, we certainly learned a tremendous amount by just listening to your comments and contributions during the webinar. And I do hope some of these ideas will, um, you know, um, also find um, mention in our paper as we um, produce the final versions of it. Thank you so much for engaging with us and giving us this time to share your ideas on some of these aspects. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll say this in English. Um, let me begin just with uh, a few uh, comments in terms of, of next steps. Um, we will be at the association uh, circulating a forum among our Sudanese participants and also among those who unfortunately could not join us today. Perhaps we did not hear enough of all the participants, partly maybe because it was a lot to engage with and in circulating those forums, what we hope is also for written comments that perhaps might now arise as a result of this discussion today uh, that we would also convey to you. So as a first step, we will be doing that with our Sudanese colleagues. Um, as we also uh, said initially, we do not consider um, these, these papers as, as final products, but rather look forward to maybe now uh, receiving final versions with additional uh, insights that might have emerged out of, out of this conversation. But also importantly, we do intend to translate these papers into Arabic and for them to be also uh, perhaps easier to use, to refer to, um, not just uh, in this group, but beyond. And I would like to say too, that we do not think of these um, events as one-off initiatives. We truly uh, are trying to provide as many spaces, as many forums within our very limited means as possible. But Andrew, back to your suggestion, uh, it does seem, and this comment of Catherine's and nation building, that this idea of core principles, fundamental principles, basic principles, call it what you may, must be somehow at the core of any civil society broad conversation. And we, and I think Sammy would agree, would like to explore ways of maybe engaging in this further. So again, uh, we do hope to keep building um, on this, uh, dialogue that we had here today on the papers uh, with this group of Sudanese um, civil society representatives that we had the pleasure to, to meet in Kampala despite the difficult circumstances that they are all experiencing. And lastly, and obviously a big, big thanks uh, to Catherine, to Andrew, to Christina, even though she left, because uh, I also bear witness to the fact that they tried their very best to speak to the Sudanese context while being very keenly aware of the challenges and not to just draw on expertise or comparative examples, but rather really, really speak to that context. So a big, big thank you. We really appreciate your input and we really hope uh, for you to participate with us in future such discussions. And I see Selma again raise her hand and please, of course, Yes, and I think Tamara, we you always thank us, but we never thank you. I think really AACL and ID, I think this was a really thought provoking conversation. Um, so I just want to say thank you to the AACL team and to this rep like to the presenters today, Catherine, Andrew, and Christine. I think for me specifically on behalf of you know the Sudanese experts group that's attending this workshop and specifically also to Sami. And shukran, thank you guys a lot for, for this really thought-provoking conversation. I think, you know, even for us, I think as Sudanese, there's a lot to take away from this conversation. So I just want to also thank you guys, I think, because you're always thanking us, but we never thank you. So thank you. All right, Sami, okay. Sami, do you want to say anything? Yes, uh, thank you, Tamar. Actually, it's uh, 
It was a very uh, great pleasure actually having this distinguished speaker, uh, Christina and Catherine and Andrew. And also uh, thank you for our Sudanese colleagues uh, who make a time, who made a time to attend and to be part of this discussion. And maybe a hundred thanks to Tamara and her colleagues in the ASEL and, and others behind the scenes those who are supporting this uh, events. That's actually what was a part of a series of uh, seminars, workshops, and round tables that uh, uh, International Idea they, they, they committed to, to do with it is uh, part including ASEL. And just before that one, we, we, we made two or three uh, of those uh, seminars and workshops on the constitutional arrangement for the post-conflict Sudan. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Catherine, and also thank you for Christina. And hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch and continue on the same line. Over to you, uh, Tamara. And just one last thank you also to the interpreter um, for, for providing uh, simultaneous interpretation. We know how challenging it can be. Um, thank you, everyone. Shukran la jamia wa ila liqa kariban. Sawpa na tawasal maakun. Zan bi sha'in al muqtarahat wa nitmana anno liqa ikun arib. Thank you very much and have a lovely one. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Shukran. Shukran. Bye.